Uh, welcome to day two of Steg's uh, 2022 annual conference. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, day uh, yesterday. We have another great uh, schedule programmed for today. Um, I want to uh, welcome you all. Um, we have a, a fantastic uh, keynote speaker to start the day off with, um, uh, Laura Alfaro from the Harvard Business School. She's a Warren Alpert Professor of Business Administration there. Uh, she's uh, tremendously accomplished in the field. Um, and she is a... Uh, um, written on uh, multinational work, uh, written on many things, um, research associate at the NBER, International Finance and Macro Group and International Trade and Investment Groups at here, uh, here at CEPR. She's also a research associate. Um, she's been involved in policy as the Minister of National Planning and Economic Policy in Costa Rica. Uh, she's actually, we're very grateful to have her today because immediately after, this keynote, she has to testify uh, in front of Congress, the United States Congress. So obviously a very important and accomplished uh, academic. Um, for the talk and for the day in general, let me just quickly go over house rules. Uh, Everybody is set up as a participant, uh, but you've been, we've been doing Zoom for a while. So, you know, please mute uh, in general. And um, Laura is uh, going to uh, talk for uh, 45 minutes. Um, she's invited to uh, clarifying questions if they need to be uh, asked. Um, and then we'll have 15 minutes for more general questions. If you have these more general questions, uh, please, um, you know, enter them in the chat and I will try to, uh, you know, aggregate them into questions for her. Um, uh, with that, uh, Laura, uh, Doug, do you have anything else you want to add? Nope, sounds great. Just delighted, Laura, and we look forward to this. Okay, go ahead, Laura. Thank you very much for the for the invitation. That was a longer, a long version of the introduction. Um, let me share uh, my slides. Can you see them? Perfectly. Yes. So uh, this is co-author work with Maggie Chen and David Chor. Let me give you a little bit of a motivation, although perhaps, again, especially there, this is all well known. As you know, there has been this um, growing anti-globalization sentiment uh, fueled by a series of events, if you want, uh, Brexit, uh, Trump, but again, it's, it's being a little bit more generalized than just the US and, and the UK. On top of that, we were shocked uh, by the pandemic, COVID, an unprecedented global economic shock in a world where already governments and firms were reevaluating their global value chain strategies, the shock reinforced uh, these thoughts. Many governments have taken unilateral uh, actions to try to bring back uh, production, uh, onshoring, nearshoring. And in a way, um, it is kind of interesting that this is happening recently because a lot of the underlying trends um, precede this decade. We can go back to 2000s on, or even the 80s. And I usually tell this, um, if, if anyone remembers the songs of uh, Bruce Springsteen or, or Bon Jovi living on a play, player, they're all about declining manufacturing, the declining uh, wages for low-skilled workers, the increasing income inequality. And again, all of these trends do precede uh, this decade, but it's lately that political actors have been extremely successful in giving voice to these uh, concerns. And again, there, there's the rise of all these political platforms ba based on uh, blaming a globalization, imports, migration. As I mentioned, the global uh, health shock perhaps uh, fed on these uh, preceding trends. And on top of that, uh, most of the information that is being conveyed is quick, fast Twitter. What we argue is not always evidence research based. And so what we wanna do in this paper is we want to, uh, 
understand if the information participants or public is getting exposed to online influence their trade views and by how much. In particular, we want to know if research-based information treatments affect participants or people, the public's view on globalization. And the way we're going to explore this is through a series of online surveys that are randomized that we have been conducting since 2018. In fact, we, we actually started to do some tests and different rounds since 2017. But in this presentation, I'm going to present uh, results from, from four rounds of uh, information uh, treatments and surveys. So the surveys have what we call a pure control where we provide no information. Then we give research-based treatments uh, on the relationship between openness and US labor markets. Again, as I said, drawn on uh, uh, evidence, summarized by what we call a narrative that says trade hurts jobs, another one that is trade helps jobs, and another one that is trade helps prices. After we expose the participants to the different information treatments, we ask them their views on um, different economic policies. Since we've been conducting this since uh, 2018, we, oops, we, our time frame allows to compare pre-COVID and post-COVID, uh, and also we can control for the Black Lives uh, Movement in the US. So to give you a little bit more information on the treatment, that trade hurts job treatment is based on the narrative and the evidence from author Don and Hansen. So we expose participants to the information that import competition from China weaken manufacturing employment and low skill wages. We also expose, again, randomized a set of participants to trade helps jobs based on Lorenzo Caliento and co-authors evidence. A, Service jobs have outstripped the job losses in manufacturing. Cheaper inputs from abroad have made the US manufacturing firm most, uh, more cost competitive. We also expose participants to help price, help, trade helps prices. In particular, we showed them evidence that imports from China lower prices of goods. In particular, we showed them evidence of nominal uh, reductions in, in prices. And we have different variations of trade helps prices, as I'll explain later in more detail. Just to give you a summary of our findings, uh, a preview, uh, we have more than 15,000 participants on the different rounds. I'm going to mostly show results for the stratified samples we commissioned to affirm to Qualtrics. Uh, and to the particular treatments I mentioned, we also had some, some other treatments, uh, as I'll explain in a little bit more detail. We have more than 12,000 uh, respondents. So again, to give you an overview, when we ask participants to express policy preferences and a yes, no, most participants do prefer more limiting imports, um, 57, 62%. However, when we ask them to rank, the share that select that their preferred policy is limited on imports is just 20, 30%. In fact, most of the people in terms of preferences, uh, when asked to rank, they prefer higher taxes, higher minimum wage, improvement in education. And, and, they think, and we think this on its own is, is an interesting finding. It does, ma it does matter if you ask them yes, no, or if you force them to rank uh, their preferences. The trade hurts jobs narratives, uh, statistically significant in all the rounds, thus increase the likelihood the participants will choose more limits on imports. However, every time we expose our participants to trade helps, we not only find not significant results, sometimes we actually find puzzling results. So stressing job gains did not increase the likelihood the participants will prefer more globalization, less uh, limits on imports. In fact, when we mentioned trade helps prices, we actually got the puzzling result that we would get people to be more protectionist. So we tell them prices went down, they want more protection on imports. 
We also find that attention matters. Uh, it, we do check that our results are being driven by uh, participants that recall uh, the treatment. So our puzzling results are not driven by, by people not understanding. The longer they stay in the treatment, we, we got them in general to say or, or to move towards more expected uh, results in terms of uh, job protections. Um, no, again, so, so, so attention and time matters. And every time there was a major shock, like the Black Lives Movement, I, we found evidence that people would find less interest in, in engaging with these uh, topics. So, so in general, attention matters and trying to maintain people engaged actually does help in terms of conveying the information. However, that was not the case for all treatments, in particular treatments that mentioned uh, China. So we went and looked at mechanisms. And in general, we find evidence that the trade hurts treatments are reinforcing prior beliefs positions in the uh, left right spectrum. We follow up with a series of questions asking participants why they chose imports. Um, and consistently, we get concerns related to the job market and China. Trade exposure variables in general were insignificant. So uh, uh, this does suggest that it's just hard to persuade the public, um, might be that their previous uh, positions, but also there is this uh, concern about China and the effects on the job market, which is an interesting result because in general, our trade theories, even when they're about monopolies, they're about firms, not sovereigns. And there seems to be something related to trade with China that, that is uh, generating uh, concerns. Again, it's just very difficult to communicate to the public uh, trade uh, has uh, gained. Although uh, some of the treatments we conducted where we spend a little bit more time explaining trade hurts and then trade helps, did uh, manage to um, dampen down the effects of uh, trade hurts. So, so again, there might be some, some, something in terms of trying to engage participants longer, uh, not really what, what tends to happen in this uh, online Twitter world where we, uh, uh, a lot of information is getting conveyed. Caveats, of course, uh, external validity. We're doing this uh, via internet-based surveys. But as I said, I, I do think this does um, replicate some of the ways uh, people are getting information. Now, there is the question of the persistence of effects. Some of the first rounds we conducted, we did it on MTurk and we follow up. Uh, we got some evidence of persistence after two months, but, but again, it's, 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 it, we treat those with a little bit of care. Again, th there are some, some issues in trying to follow up on uh, participants in this type of service. There's a very uh, broad literature. Uh, I am, I'm of course not uh, doing justice to all this literature. There's a lot of previous work that has looked at the role of trade policy preferences using a uh, national surveys, the World Value Service, Bloomingen has used the American National Election. It, this uh, literature has established a very important and uh, stable correlations. But there's always the concern that there might be unobserved uh, characteristics. And so there is now a growing uh, literature that has used randomization. And, uh, and as I said, this has been used in immigration, taxes, and redistribution. Perhaps more related to our work uh, that has used randomization in, in trade is the work by Ditela, Stefania, and um, this nice work done in Latin America by Rodriguez and co authors. What we argue is the difference from our work in theirs is that most of these existing papers have presented hypothetical situations. Uh, so for example, Ditella and Rodrik tell them uh, to summarize and, and perhaps simplify, the manager is to blame for, for, for the uh, bad outcomes of the firm. We, we are not conveying a hypothetical, we are conveying research-based uh, information to the participants and also brief our, our treatments uh, are designed to be given in, in five minutes. So let me go now into a little bit more details of the survey, uh, some of our finding and concluding remarks. 
So as I mentioned, our objective is to provide a short uh, user-friendly survey. We mounted it on, on Qualtrics. Uh, we don't want participants to spend more than five and top 10 minutes. Uh, and so that was one constraint where when designing uh, the survey, and so that also constrained uh, uh, some of the things uh, we could ask. The first part of the survey asked a lot of uh, background information, gender, age, race, country of birth, state of residence, education, employment status, and household income. In a second part, we asked participants to uh, share beliefs and positions where they place themselves liberal, conservative in terms of economic policy, but we also asked them uh, who, uh, who the candidate they supported in the last two elections. By now, we, we have gone through two rounds of national elections. Then we asked them their views on income inequality, if they think it's a problem, how much they can trust the government, the satisfaction with the US job market. Um, we also asked them uh, how they, what they thought was the impact of NAFTA on, on their family. And we use this as a benchmark as well, of whether people in general are against trade or if there's something more in particular. We also ask willingness to pay for a brand. And we also have questions, proxies for loss aversion, uh, differences between discounts and fees and how much would they will be willing uh, to sell or buy uh, a cell phone. We also ask information, the news source, how often do they follow the news, the main sources of uh, TV, newspaper, internet, and so on. We then expose participants to the information treatments. As I said, we have that trade hurts jobs, trade helps jobs. Then there are some treatment where we expose them to both. First, the hurts jobs, helps jobs, and then we switch. Then we ask them trade help prices. Here we included a couple of variations. Uh, one in particular, it, so we were, we were worried that people may take lower prices as low quality. So we changed some of the wording and we also excluded China. We also had a treatment that mentioned tariffs hurt prices. As I said, these are evidence-based uh, narratives. And so let me show you in more detail. So that trade hurts jobs is based on Otto, Dorn, and Hansen. A, a line of research has shown the U.S. substantially increases imports from China after China joined the WTO. This has been a major force in the reduction of employment in manufacturing sector and weak uh, wage growth. And so the treatments, we presented text and we also present some graphics, figures, some people are better reading and understanding from text. Some people are better understanding from uh, graphs. So, so we combine uh, both methods. Then we have trade helps jobs. Here, we told them again the same. A, a line of research has shown that there has an increase in imports from China. This has enabled the US to specialize in services and has uh, led to an increase in uh, the number of jobs. And so we showed them that the increase in, in total employment. Trade health prices, again, the same introduction. And then we tell them that this has increased the uh, cheaper goods. And in particular, we mentioned computers, electro electrical products and furniture and also apparel, and we showed them uh, a figure that conveys uh, prices. And again, we tried to pick uh, items where there was a nominal decrease in prices, not, not to get into real and nominal. As I mentioned, we were a little bit worried that perhaps people would take a cheaper as low quality. So we changed a little bit uh, the, the, the wording and we said, increase the availability of goods. And in one, we got rid of the word China if Chinese goods may have been associated with, with a cheaper a quality, a lower quality. We also expose participants explicitly to a narrative trade hurts prices. And here we draw from the recent evidence that uh, the, the recent round of tariffs in the US increased uh, prices. And so we, we showed them
after uh, we expose participants to this information, we ask them simple yes, no questions. Do you support more limit on imports? Yes, no. We also ask, do you support increasing tariffs? We ask both ways. Uh, again, we, we follow some of the existing uh, national surveys, but also it's possible that uh, people may not necessarily have a clear view of uh, tariffs uh, and may relate more to just a limiting imports, or they might have a more complicated view of the effects of tariffs on quantities. In any case, we ask uh, both ways. We also ask them if they support the tariffs just in certain industries and which ones. Then we have, do you support minimum wage? We also had a little bit of a horse race if they support the taxes or tariffs. And we also asked them whether they were in favor of free trade agreements. We then ask them to rank and we ask them to pick three, uh, which are their preferred choices in terms of taxes, minimum wage, uh, unemployment benefits, improving education, more limits on imports, weakening the US dollar, exiting from free trade agreements or more limits in immigration. As Danny Drodrick has uh, written in his handbook chapter, Sometimes tariffs are just an imperfect policy to redistribute. And, and so that's why we thought it, it's important to just ask them to rank uh, in terms of different policy options. An important thing we did is we randomized the options. Uh, we found out that actually it, it matters. Uh, so every participant received a different randomization of the different options. And we also asked them separately if they prefer um, to rank their least preferred policies. We ask them validation. Uh, we explicitly ask them if, they, if the treatments have affected their views. We also ask a broad validation, whether the treatment was about prices or jobs. Again, um, just to get a, a sense of, of a, whether they at least broadly understood the treatment. Then we explicitly asked them to explain why they chose limits on imports, if that was the case. And we gave them for some options. I'm concerned about US imports from China. I'm concerned about national security. I am concerned that they might be lower quality. Even if imports help jobs, there are other concerns. I'm not persuaded by uh, the treatments or imports competes for jobs. We also allowed an option for them just to write and tell us uh, their views. And uh, as I said, is, uh, in the post-COVID rounds, we asked them some views on how COVID has affected their, their views on trade. And if they think uh, COVID uh, justifies certain restrictions, uh, movement of people, medical goods, goods in general, or uh, bringing manufacturing back. And we also asked them uh, how COVID had affected uh, their views on China. So we implemented, as I said, a different rounds. Uh, we started with some tests back in 2017. We also did the first rounds, uh, very early rounds in MTurk. In terms uh, of the stratified samples that we commissioned to Qualtrix, those are stratified by gender, age, race, and education. Uh, we had one round in August 2018, a round in April to 19, June 20, June 21. In these later rounds, we asked the COVID questions and we also asked the evidence on tariffs. In earlier rounds, in these first ones, we also had a treatment that told them it's not trade if you want, it's technology based on uh, the work by Daron Asemo Glue and co authors. We didn't get a lot of traction, so, so we excluded. Uh, that treatment in later rounds, again, to accommodate so, some of the changes we did in, in, the, in the prices uh, treatment. And as I said, this very early round uh, on Amazon, we also had a follow-up. So this is just to um, give you a sense of the samples. As I said, in general, they're balanced in terms of representative of the US in terms of gender, uh, race, um, uh, income, we also got uh, a representation in terms of the sector, uh, keep in mind that in the US manufacturing is less than 10%. So broadly, uh, it does mimic the US uh, characteristics. 
and and then we had different uh, results in terms of their their beliefs and 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 preferences. So in the first, uh, just to give you uh, uh, some summary statistics, again, some unconditional means, when we ask participants to express their views on whether they want to limit imports, as I said, 57% of, of the sample was in favor of limiting imports. It went up a little bit in the COVID, uh, post-COVID rounds, it went down a, a little bit. And, and I think people have, have gotten a sense of this. There was a view that COVID was this dramatic transformation, but, but it seems to have been settled. It's, it was still a little bit higher than the, the first one. What is interesting is when we ask folks, should they increase tariffs? Yes, no, it's lower. Um, again, it, it might be that people just don't like the word tariffs. Maybe they associate it with a tax and they don't like that. Or they have a very complicated and, um, and complex view of tariffs. But, but there is a difference in those, in those two. Uh, and again, when compared with the preference for the other policies, they actually do prefer other policies. And this is what we get when we ask participants to rank. When you ask them, give me your preferred policies, only 23% to 28% chose limits on imports of their preferred policy. Most of the participants uh, chose taxation, education, minimum wage. I have to say that the least, least favorite is weakening the exchange rate. So if anyone is in politics, that doesn't really give you a lot of votes. Talking about depreciating the exchange rate doesn't really seem to get a lot of traction. Uh, so we didn't follow up uh, a lot on, on that policy. Um, so again, it, it does suggest that these, when you force them to rank, you, you do get a little bit of differences. So then we look at the results, uh, the way uh, we did this. So we have, yes. Was there a question? No. Yes, no. Okay. So uh, we look at a dummy variable of whether the respondent expressed a preference for a policy in question. We run this against uh, the, the a treatment dummy, whether the respondent received a treatment or not. The omitted cate category is the pure control. So, so we can just interpret uh, the coefficient as relative to the no information control. We, as I said, um, uh, check that the responding characteristics were balanced across samples. We include a battery of controls. We include all of our bio data, the dummy for gender, age, group, race, if they were born in the US, their employment status, the sector of employment, household income beans, and also the uh, region of residence. Because we have the region of residence, we could control for a lot of uh, uh, region characteristics. In fact, we also control of whether of the, the China shock. Again, views may be driven not per se by your uh, reality, but the reality of your community. And so we control uh, uh, for that. We control for political positions in the first round to 16 election in the later rounds to 20 as well, where they follow uh, TV. Uh, and again, um, a bunch of uh, county characteristics, if the share of people that are located, if the production, if it's manufacturing, if it's a, a survey, a, a urban dummy. We also use weak uh, dummies. Again, it might be picking up recent events. We run this as a profit, uh, but we also report the first principal component uh, constructed so that it's increasing on more limits on trade. And we did a bunch of cleaning of the samples. And so this is the, the uh, what we call the pre-COVID surveys here. Uh, I'm including the round of 218 and the round of 219. And so when we expose participants to narratives that trade hurts jobs, we got them to increase the probability to choose more limits on imports 
the estimates were uh, quantitative important, and as I will say, they were uh, significant. We tend to compare them with uh, political uh, beliefs, which was consistently one of the uh, significant uh, controls. So we found that when exposed to trade her jobs, more participants, there will be uh, the participants will increase the likelihood to choose more limits on imports. They also increase the likelihood for choosing increasing tariffs, supporting tariff, higher tariffs for certain industries. They were less uh, supportive of free trade agreements, although this one in particular was not significant. When we asked them to rank, most of them uh, were moved to choose limits on imports as one of the preferred uh, uh, policy choices. The principal component, again, positive and significant. However, when we expose participants to trade helps jobs, our results are not significant. And if anything, they actually had, um, they were also uh, positive. So, so we're not able to move participants when exposed to trade helps jobs. Uh, uh, so the results from different treatments are not uh, symmetric. Again, uh, we don't seem to get uh, significant, although again, if anything, they tend to be positive. We did this again in the post-COVID uh, rounds. And again, uh, what I'm presenting is a pool round of uh, 220, 221. And again, the same asymmetric result. Every time we expose participants to trade herds jobs, we get the participants to become more protectionist, increase the likelihood of choosing more limited imports, increasing tariffs, support on a higher type of certain industries. In fact, in these rounds, we actually got the, the, the reduction in supporting free trade agreements to be uh, significant and negative. So, so they become less in favor. Overall, again, choosing uh, more protectionist policies. When we expose them to trade helps jobs, we don't find significant uh, results. As I said, in terms of the quantitative effect, it is similar to the one third of the magnitude of being a Republican candidate. As, 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 uh, as you know, uh, previous surveys used to find that Republicans tended to be more portrayed. This change and was picked up of, uh, in previous surveys. So again, this is not something that uh, we're discovering. It, it, it has been documented. And, and again, our treatment is a one third of the effect of being a Republican. In terms of other variables that matter, as I told you, the, the, candidate, uh, the, the support in presidential election, older folks tend to be more uh, protectionist. Uh, the literature tends to find patterns on uh, race and gender. We don't find significant results there. In college education, we tend to find it to be significant for prices, but not for jobs. If the participants were watching Fox News, they were more against trade. If they were following BBC and CNN, more in favor of trade. And as I mentioned, randomization order uh, matters. And so we also expose participants, um, as I said, to this treatment. Trade has a lower prices, and we expose. And what is interesting is that we actually got very puzzling results when we told participants trade lower prices. We actually got participants to more likely choose limits on imports. Um, and so, and again, it was consistent of, over different questions, principal component, positive and significant. So we were puzzled by these results. So we follow up, as I said, maybe we thought participants were taking this to be a quality issue. So we, in the later rounds into 2021, exposed uh, different treatments in terms of prices, uh, what we had before uh, that mentioned China, a treatment that changed cheaper for just more availability. And we also exposed them to explicitly trade Hertz prices. And we continue to get the similar puzzling result. Any mention of 
prices will turn, uh, increase the likelihood the participants would become more against trade. In fact, a, a result that we found interesting is when we mentioned China is when we got uh, the, the quantitatively the largest uh, coefficients. And so we, we decided to follow up a little bit more on that. It, as I said, we did check in all of these results if uh, participants expressed that the treatment affected their views. We also had uh, validations related to whether participants could recall broadly the treatment. And so we, in general, do get that most participants recall the treatment. We get that when we ask uh, and, and formalize the, the whether the folks who got job treatments didn't mention that they were job treatment. We, in average, did get this to be uh, significant. We also find that participants who take longer to answer uh, the treatments it managed to get um, was related to getting the, the type of treatment uh, that was given correct, but also they they would move to, if you want, the expected uh, results that we were thought we would get in most of the cases, except uh, cases where we mentioned China. And again, we did follow up on that. So again, our puzzling results don't seem to be driven by people just not recalling uh, the treatments. And so in the last section, um, we try to understand some of the different mechanisms. Why was trade hurt uh, carrying so much traction in our surveys? And so we uh, run the same regressions and we interacted with different uh, respondent characteristics. The way we thought about uh, these characteristics, Baldwin has a nice uh, journal of economic perspectives where he says, well, we can think of uh, trade policy being driven by economic, economic self-interest all the variables that affect your income. So we have a share of variables uh, that are related to this personal uh, exposure, industry of employment, location, unemployment. We also have uh, education. Again, uh, some of these proxies may be picking different characteristics, uh, education in particular, but, but we uh, put them in, under the economic self-interest type of um, explanations. There might be also social uh, concerns uh, where the government is trying to promote policies based on distribution. Uh, there might be some broader views on whether you can trust government. And so we have a uh, proxies for social concerns. We also have proxies for identity politics. Grossman and Heldman have a nice recent paper where your positions are not driven per se by uh, your personal um, effects, but because you want to belong to a particular group, in this case, a political party. So we look at a uh, political positions. And there's also uh, papers that have looked at different preferences, behavioral, uh, if you want economic, uh, changing a little bit the preference to include um, loss aversion. And so we have proxies uh, for that. So we look at economic self-interest, social identity politics, and behavioral. And so the traditional trade literature will tell us, well, depending on your exposure, uh, your capital labor, depending on the exposure of your country uh, to the rest of the world, it might differentially affect your way. In particular, uh, it may be that the manufacturing sector uh, may be more likely to be against uh, trade and the treatment may disproportionately affect these folks. But when we go and control for manufacturing, of whether the person is employed in manufacturing, we don't get significant results uh, from the interaction. So, so it's not that per se, this is being driven by uh, uh, folks in the manufacturing sector. We also checked and it's not particularly driven by uh, location folks in uh, communities that were negatively affected by China imports. Uh, we use the ADH uh, variables. We also check it was not per se driven by folks that are in general against trade, and we use uh, NAFTA as, as a proxy. 
It was also not particularly driven by a education levels, college educated. So in general, we got very little traction from some of these, um, if you want, economic self-interest variables. In the paper, we present more results. We look at import, a, a income, unemployment status. And again, we, we found very little traction uh, from this uh, mechanism. We then look at social concerns. In particular, it could be that uh, participants were move because of income inequality concerns. So, so we control for the ones that express that to be a reason. We also didn't find a significant results. In, there is a literature in the US that have found that, that perhaps this income inequality doesn't have as much traction as, as one may think it to be. What is interesting is we did find some traction from trust in government. So participants who expressed that they trust a uh, government actually were less likely to be moved by the treatments. And so it, and the hypothesis is that these are the folks who believe that trust the government is capable and willing to act on these issues by using other policies. And indeed these folks did seem to prefer uh, taxes and, and some other forms of distribution. Identity politics, as I mentioned, this was in both in levels and interaction, one of the most significant uh, variables in terms of being able to uh, explain some of that result. So it does seem to be reinforcing some political priors that in the US have changed with now the Republican party being more against trade than the Democrat party. In the survey, we had different proxies uh, for loss aversion. And we checked, uh, we didn't seem to get a lot of traction in terms of jobs, but we did get some traction in explaining the puzzling results of prices. So there seems to be something related to loss aversion in prices that uh, seem uh, to explain some of our puzzling uh, results. So as I said, we, in the last part of the paper, we ex the survey, we explicitly asked participants to explain to us why they chose most limits on imports. And we consistently uh, got results that were suggestive that it is something about the job market, it is something about China. So we went and uh, in particular look at, 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 at the, at, at these uh, reasons, when we explain uh, the different reasons why, as I mentioned, we asked them uh, to choose uh, persuaded, uh, lower quality, compete with jobs, national security on China. So something that was worrying, it, worrying us was that people may be taking low prices and low quality, and we don't have evidence uh, related to that. So, so that concern was not there. When exposed to the price treatments, the positive part treatments and still choosing uh, to limit imports, what we got was that participants were not persuaded by the treatment. Uh, so there's something about prices that, that was not uh, convincing them. When we exposed them uh, with treatments that were saying that trade was helping jobs, they also would tell us that, nope, there is something about imports that compete with jobs. I am very worried about national security. I am concerned about China. It was interesting that every time we got the China, it became something about jobs. It became something about uh, national security. Or we, when we talk about jobs, again, a lot mentioning of China. So it seems that these are some concerns that are salient in the participants. So we went and looked um, more in detail about. Uh, these concerns about China. And indeed, we did find that is related to this dissatisfaction on the job market uh, and uh, political uh, preferences. Again, the Republicans being the party against trade, but also perhaps a little bit more worried about China. And we also found this, again, this result that participants who trusted more government uh, would be less worried about uh, China. And as I said, uh, we do find these results to be interesting because most of our trade theories 
are not about uh, competition with governments or sovereigns. Um, they are still about uh, firms, and so there, there might be something in these concerns that are that are getting expressed. Uh, as as I also said, what we thought was interesting is we've been doing this almost for five years, and these concerns, at least in this period, seem to be very stable, uh, despite uh, the, the 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 shocks. Just to conclude with a little bit more positive uh, results, when we engage participants with the treatments that explain a little bit more trade hurts, trade helps, or trade helps and trade helps uh, jobs. When the sequence was trade hurts, but it also creates jobs, we actually got muted effects on protectionism. So, so still people were becoming more likely to choose protectionist policies, but the effects were more muted, uh, which makes us uh, think that perhaps this engaging participants and explaining a little bit more that the whole uh, effects may be the way to go in try to uh, convey some more positive results. And so to conclude, um, the trade hurts narratives uh, have traction, they shift policy preferences towards being protectionist, results with trade helps are not symmetric, because of randomization, we can interpret this uh, as uh, uh, with causality. Uh, attention plays a role. If you engage participants a little bit longer or they stay with you a little bit longer, you tend uh, to get them to uh, perhaps uh, move towards uh, where we thought they were moving in terms of policy choices. This was general the case, except when uh, we mentioned China. So again, it does seem that there is some salience about uh, reinforcing identity politics, but also jobs and China. Broader implications for us that teach economics um, and are in the public arena, if you want, is a, perhaps a pessimistic view on this way that we're all trying to engage the public now, the Twitter quick online. It doesn't seem to be the best method to try to convey these complex uh, topics. Again, uh, perhaps a little bit more hope in the narratives that spend a little bit more time uh, engaging participants. And let me stop here. Thank you, uh, Laura. Laura, that was uh, wonderful. Um, since uh, I'm uh, hosting, I get to ask the first question, which I, I get priority here. And, um, you know, Steg's structural transformation is a big deal. And I thought that, you know, like your focus is sort of on what, what is it about the participants that makes them more receptive to the trade hurts versus trade helps jobs. But the focus could also be on the messages in the sense that it, we, the, the, or, or how can, can you distinguish this, which is kind of, it could be that trade hurts manufacturing jobs but trade helps service jobs. And people think manufacturing jobs are much better jobs. They, you know, they associate service jobs with MIC jobs and manufacturing with well-paying jobs. Um, is that something that you can rule out or you've looked into? So again, um, so we set some rules and one was we were trying to convey research-based evidence. And the research-based evidence is it's hurting manufacturing jobs and is affecting low skill wages. Um, and so that, that was the treatment uh, we gave them. We, we checked uh, manufacturing, we didn't have significant results. So, 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 so that hypothesis, that is just because people think manufacturing jobs are better jobs, we didn't get significant results on that. So that is not what is driven um, in the results. Um, we didn't ask them explicitly if they think service job, which is very broad, is, is, is better or not. When we control for services, we actually got them uh, to be against trade, which at first one may think is bizarre, but services is very, very broad. Um, and so you can have someone in a restaurant that is services and you have an accounting and a lawyer that is services. 
so we control a little bit more for occupation and then we don't get anything. So, so in general, things that we tend to think would explain based on economics, we didn't get significant results. What we did get is a very generalized concern about the job market. So folks who were worried about the situation of the job market in the US, those were the ones that disproportionately were moved by uh, the treatments. Now, th there's a moment that is very hard with these surveys to differentiate what about the job market, in part because we don't ask and be I mean, explicitly, but there's a moment that when you start running the fourth interaction, you start running out of, of, of sure. um, information. But the economic exposure, location, anything that you can think of, we have run, it is not explaining our results. Um, uh, Adrian Wood had some uh, questions about how you incentivize the sample. I, I was actually curious too, and not being someone on social media about how the sample was drawn. Adrian, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, thanks, I can do that. No, I was simply wondering how, how these participants were drawn into the survey in the first place. Um, were they offered any kind of financial incentive or did they just kind of volunteer? Um, and does the mode of selection and recruitment possibly affect the nature of the responses? So they, they're getting paid. Uh, it's, it's not a lot, but also they're not spending. A, a lot of time, but they're getting paid uh, 250. We, we benchmarked, that is usually what people were doing. We first did MTurk, which is this platform where you put a survey and people answer. After talking to colleagues who have been doing this a lot, um, they suggested we change to a company. There are concerns in MTurk, uh, even if you clean the samples that you not always know who's answering this. Um, there's many tricks people can play with their IPs. And so we just paid a company and this company is the one that is doing the stratified sample uh, for us. So these are people you, who, who are relatively, they're motivated by a relatively small amount of money and they've uh, got, spe and they've got, is that right? I, I mean, I don't know if 250 even the minimum wage in certain places for doing something five minutes or 10 is a little money. Yeah, I think, I mean, it wouldn't, yeah, it wouldn't motivate a lawyer, for example. No, 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 um, fair enough. And, 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 and also these are people who have got time on their hands because there are quite a lot of people who would like to answer surveys that just feel they're too busy. Um, so it seems to me your, your respondents are, in the bottom, likely to be in the bottom half of the income distribution, so is, relatively leisure, leisure, le, um, not not desperately pressured for, for, for work. So a couple of things. Um, as I said, our samples are stratified by characteristics of the US. Yeah. So they do match the US okay. characteristics in terms of gender, age, employment status, a, and, and sector. Income, we're not going to get the super rich. That is a fact. Um, in fact, uh, we cap our income in more than 150,000. Um, but I'm actually not super worried about not having the, the people above uh, 200,000. But, but in terms of the sample, it looks like a sample of the US. Yeah, De demographically, the, the, I can see that. Yeah. Now, as I said, there is the validation of whether. Um, this has external validity once you engage uh, folks uh, like yeah. this. And, yeah. and that I agree is a concern, but um, I actually do think that you are getting to a significant uh, proportion of the population yeah. that that is uh, how they're engaging. But again, that, that I agree with the, the overall caveat. Having said that, it's just very hard to get everyone. The, if you do a person, <clears throat> Um, survey that also has selection bias. Um, the, the people who will talk to you um, or answer a phone or Absolutely. like all, all of these methods yep. have a bias yep. and, and, and it is a... It may very well be that the listening side of social media disproportionately engages people with uh, a lot of time on their hands anyway. Yeah, um, so <laughs> ju just a last comment. So we did this during COVID. So I'm <clears> not as worried about some, so, so we're actually asking people at the time where everyone is at home. 
so 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 that has other set of biases but but there was a moment that everyone was locked in and they could do this because they had more time in their hands and as i said it increased a little bit but not as much and so the fact that we have been doing this now for five years and it's relatively stable for us to just that there is something there despite the concerns. I'm, I'm not at all surprised better. by your results. I found your results uh, entirely convincing. I mean, I suppose my other question is this, the problem you face is it's like jury selection in a trial, which has been very widely publicized in the newspapers. In a sense, it's very unlikely you could find anybody in the US who hadn't heard something about concerns about trade and the effects of trade. Well, no, I agree, that's fine, but we're randomizing. So that's the other thing. So, so we're providing treatments in a randomized way. And that was a concern we had, it's just salient. And indeed we find that it's salient, but in particular for Republicans yeah. and particular uh, for people to express certain views. What we also thought was interesting is that NAFTA, which is perhaps the more important trade agreement of the US and in quantitative effects was not something that people are per se against. In fact, most of the population tend to say it was positive to the US. And we use that a little bit. Well, what happens is people are just in general against trade. So we checked what happens with the people who, who said that and it's not driven by some prior that trade is hurtful. It is Thanks. something about mentioning China. Yeah. Yeah. And the current round. Yeah. Terrific bit of analysis. Thank you. Annie uh, Tubaji had some questions about uh, education that were in the chat. You talked a bit about education. I'm not sure if they got addressed, but Annie, if you wanted to follow up, you can unmute. Hi. Well, thanks. It was very interesting and uh, I always find very precious information which is based on uh, primary data collection. But um, I was wondering about the education, whether it would make sense to ask them also what uh, kind of um, topic they are they're competent in, you know, because if you ask uh, biologists or if you ask a musician, they may have a higher education, but their understanding of economics would be, you know, <laughs> very different than a person who has a university degree in economics. Uh, so, just to control, we do ask them what is their degree. You asked, well, at, at least what I saw was um, about whether they have a university degree. Isn't yes, it? and then there was a, a, we asked them to tell us in what. I, I don't have the, I had oh, the Okay, I, I didn't yeah, see Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. so, so, so we asked them this. the level and the degree. Uh -huh. And then also this about the Trump, well, I don't know if you want me to, to ask it now, but I had written it afterwards. Um, the, um, the different waves were in the uh, 2020 and then in 2021. So I was not um, very clear whether they were asked different uh, periods under Trump and under uh, Biden. So then the trust, you know, in the, in the two governments can, can mean something different about the respondent. So, but by now we have gone through two rounds of elections. Um, we we asked them for the if they voted Republican or Democrat. We we don't ask them to. We don't ask them. Do you vote for Trump or Biden? Because we were told this. Yeah, better class I just think for, that maybe you can control simply of the type of period that they are in. Some no, no, no. That, that's what I'm saying. We have two rounds. We know if they voted Republican. We know if they voted Democrat in the two rounds. That we know. What, what I'm saying is we asked them for the political party. We didn't ask them, do you vote for Trump? We asked them, do you vote Republican? But it's the same thing. Uh, I mean, they know who, who was running. So for isn't president. it strange to have the same effect for trusting in the government if you have trusted in the Biden and if you have trusted in the Trump and it always because, has the same effect on the, the, your attitude to trade? In international so, though actually, those it is not the case that everyone who voted for Trump, when they voted for Trump, trusted the government. Those those two don't go together. <laughs> Why did they? Anyway, yeah. Okay. I mean, I mean, you can vote for a political party, 
but have a different view on whether you trust for government. Th those are not synonyms. Mm -hmm. And in fact, but we do get this, that they, they seem to be different. There, there's, there seems to be a different traction in, from trusting government and the political affiliation. Um, Kevin uh, Donovan had a question in terms of kind of differentiating your methodology from the literature. Kevin, you want to unmute and ask? Yeah, sure. So it's just sort of a small question about design. Uh, I was sort of thinking along the same questions that Joe was raising earlier, but in particular, I was trying to think about how big a difference there is in this context of, say, a hypothetical that you would give to someone and then explaining Lorenzo and co-authors work to somebody. Um, whether we think that's sort of like an important constraint to put on the design or not, because if not, it seems like it would open up the possibility of like probing things in a different way, et cetera. So I don't know if you've seen how Stefania engages participants. She has this very long engagement with participants that even include a video. But, but it's all like a, the textbook class. If you have a labor and capital and if you have more labor and now all of a sudden we trade then the return of labor. So it's like a class. That's what we call hypothetical. Uh, and it's uh, in engaging them for like 45 minutes. So that's almost like a class. The, the way Rafael does it, they say the firm did poorly, but it's because the manager, manager was incompetent. That I also think is, 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 because they tell them, you work in a firm, the firm went bankrupt, the, the manager is incompetent. The, all of that is hypothetical. You don't know if that person worked there. And that's what we're saying. We're not giving them hypothetical. We're not trying to place them in hypothetical situations. We're telling them, this is what research found. I'm trying to look through some of the uh, uh, questions. Um, um, it looks like many of them are comments rather than questions. Uh, Alexandros, did you uh, want to uh, uh, ask your question briefly? Is it's about By the open way, versus closed survey questions? Th there is a comment that it feels like people are associating prices with something about jobs and that yeah, is what we case. get when we when we follow up there seems to be something about even when i tell you your computer now is cheaper and your that people say associate that with someone lost a job yeah nezi had asked why not ask if that if if you they know someone that lost their job due to trade as well we ask them indirectly because we ask them their views about how the economy is, is doing, their views about trade, about NAFTA, so they're indirect. And then we control for the location. So we know if they were born or they currently live in places that are disproportionately uh, hit by, by trade. So, so, so all of those things uh, we control. And again, this is randomized. So. Well, let me just um, thank you, and we should wrap up now, uh, give you time to get to uh, Congress, and uh, hopefully their, their questions are as friendly as ours. Um, it was a wonderful talk, Laura. Uh, thank you for having me, and we encourage you to, uh, to stay engaged with uh, STEG in the future. Um, next, we have uh, a speed round of, of parallel sessions. All right, it's something like a miracle to be running a conference on time and still to be in the second day and in the second session and on time. So I won't spend a lot of, um, do a lot of introduction here. I'll just say our next presentation is from Yogita Shamdasani. And um, Yogita doesn't have co-authors present in the chat. So please do, um, if you have questions that are clarifying questions, put them in the chat and um, actually any kinds of questions. And I will moderate if I think they're clarifying questions, I'll, I'll stop Yogita and try to, um, try to get her to answer them in mid course. Otherwise I will digest them and moderate them for the end of her presentation. Uh, great topic, looking forward to hearing this. 
Yogita, all yours. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for having me today. This is a, a real pleasure to be telling you about my work with Maggie Liu and Viz Taraz, who are both at Smith College um, and really are the climate change experts on this paper. Um, so today I'm gonna to be telling you about climate change and labor reallocation using evidence from six decades of the Indian census. Um, so it's, you know, I don't have to really motivate this to this room. There are many people in this room who are on this slide as well. Um, and so it's been well established that um, economies in developing countries are commonly characterized by large productivity gaps between agricultural and non-agricultural sectors, between rural and urban areas, et cetera. And there's been a recent active debate on the source of these gaps. And you could think about um, the source of these gaps being labor misallocation or the sorting of workers across space or both. Um, importantly, what this tells us is that reallocation of workers across sectors in space could be beneficial for economic development if it allows for a more efficient allocation of human capital. And at the same time, in order for there to be arbitrage for that to take place, there must be both an availability of, of higher paying jobs outside of agriculture, as well as a sufficiently low cost of switching between sectors or regions. Okay, and so what we do in this paper is we bring climate change into the picture. And in particular, we explore how climate change interacts with labor reallocation in economies that rely heavily on agriculture. Okay, so why the focus on economies that rely heavily on agriculture? It's been established in the literature that higher temperatures have adverse impacts on agricultural productivity and income. And so we're thinking about developing countries these are precisely the places where there's a high share of workers in agriculture who are most likely to be vulnerable to climate risks that, that we see today and, and are going to be growing in the future. Okay, and as a result, we can imagine that rising temperatures under climate change could impede the pace of labor reallocation across sectors in space, and there could be multiple mechanisms that could be driving uh, this relationship, which I'll get into uh, much more detail in the paper. Okay, so where does this fit into the literature? So we have by now a vast literature that tells us um, about sectoral reallocation as well as rural urban migration in response to short run weather shocks. Okay, so if we have um, a bad rainfall shock or if we have a good rainfall shock or we have a good temperature shock, et cetera. But when we think about medium to long-term responses to climate variations, these effects could actually be quite different uh, fundamentally from short-term responses. And why is this the case? It's because when we think about these medium to long-term responses to climate, we need to be uh, thinking about potential adaptation that takes place, or you know, in, in the opposite way, we could think about intensification of effects that take place relative to the short-run responses to weather shocks. Okay, and so getting a, getting a sense of what these medium to long-term responses to climate variation um, is important because it's going to allow us to better approximate how agents are going to respond to anthropogenic climate change. So to give you a preview of what we do in this paper, so we're going to ask two questions. The first is, do rising temperatures under climate change affect the pace of labor reallocation within local labor markets, okay? And the spoiler is that it's yes. Um, and so then we're gonna get into our second question, which is what are the possible mechanisms that underlie these effects? Okay, and in order to do this, what we uh, assembled is a long district level panel data set spanning six decades. And so we're gonna be looking at India from 1951 up till 2011. And with this data, we're able to examine responses both um, medium term to, to medium term climate variations as well as to longer term climate variations. And I'll, I'll define what I mean by medium and long term in, in more detail. And the way we do this is we have two different empirical models, a panel fixed effects model and a long differences model. So the key takeaways, um, the first main result is that we find that rising temperatures do inhibit structural transformation in Indian districts. And, and what we mean by this is that we see that rising temperatures lead to an increase in the share of workers in agriculture. And correspondingly, we find a decline in the share of workers in non-agriculture. And unfortunately, uh, we see that these effects actually seem to be intensifying 
over a longer time frame. Okay, so we're not finding um, adaptation, but instead we're seeing that the effects appear to be getting intensified as we look um, at longer term uh, impacts. Next, moving to trying to understand what are the mechanisms underlying these effects. Um, we find evidence that's suggestive of local demand effects playing a role. And so what do I mean by local demand effects? So uh, it goes as follows. We think about a shock to agricultural productivity, which subsequently leads to a reduction in farm incomes. And this has an impact on the demand for local non-agricultural goods and services. So we see a decline in the demand for non-agricultural goods and services. And subsequently, we see a decline in the labor demand for non-agriculture. So again, I'll go through this in a lot more detail. We also consider numerous other mechanisms in the paper, and you could be thinking about other mechanisms right now. That's not the one I have up here on the slide. Um, and so, you know, we, we don't find um, strong evidence for several other mechanisms, but it's still pretty much, um, you know, we could imagine that there are multiple mechanisms at play here. Great, so let me now tell you about the context um, and then give you a preview of the data before I get into the empirics and the results. So as I mentioned, we're gonna be studying um, the context of India. So this is a context where the population is still predominantly rural. So as of the 2011 census, uh, we have a 69% of the population is rural and 55% of the labor force is engaged in agriculture. Okay, so an economy that's still heavily reliant on agriculture. And in this setting, it's been documented that structural transformation, particularly the movement from agriculture to manufacturing has been slow and stunted and partly driven by uh, the lack of growth in the manufacturing sector. It's also been documented that rural to urban migration is low um, and it's been less than 4% in recent decades. In this particular context as well, cross district migration is low. And so what this means is that movement within local labor markets is gonna be an important margin for us to think about, okay? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on movements within districts. So when I say local labor markets, I'm thinking about a district in this particular context. Okay, so we're gonna be focusing on sectoral movements and rural urban movements within districts in India. So now let me tell you about the data. So we, we put together data from, from various sources and I'm just gonna tell you about each of them quite briefly. Uh, we have a lot more detail in the data appendix in the paper. So the, the main, the main uh, source of our outcome variables comes from the Indian census. So we're gonna be using decadal data spanning these six decades. Um, and, in, and for anyone who's worked with India, you know that one of the tricky things is that the boundaries of these districts have changed tremendously over time. And so what we do is we aggregate the districts back to their original boundaries in 1961, which gives us these consistent district boundaries over the time period that we're studying. So this gives us a total of 288 districts. So we're going to look at four key district level outcomes. Okay, so we're going to look at the share of the labor force who are agricultural laborers, the share of the labor force who are non-agricultural workers, the share of the population residing in urban areas, and the share of the male population who are rural to urban intra-district migrants. Okay, so looking at, at sectoral allocation as well as rural urban movements. So that's our first main uh, source of data. We also use data from the National Sample Survey. So this is a representative survey uh, done with individuals and households across the country. So we're gonna be using two modules from this survey. We're gonna be using the employment and unemployment module and the consumer expenditure module. Okay, so you'll notice that the time period that this covers is much smaller than, than the full frame that we're looking at. Um, this is partly due to the fact that they only started uh, providing uh, you know, users with district level identifiers at this time. And so we're gonna be using this data largely um, to support our data, um, our findings with the census, and also to shed some light on the mechanisms. So, so what's nice about this data set is that it's really rich in, in different outcomes, consumption, uh, sectoral shares, et cetera. And so we're gonna use this data and aggregate up to the district level to get labor shares as well as consumption levels. 
Yogita, I have a so, question that's come up in the chat from Menace Rui. Yeah. He says, how should we think about labor markets in the context of peri-urban areas that might straddle the border of two different districts? How do you allocate um, or how do you think about those labor markets? Labor markets that straddle two districts. So what we do is we take we take the districts and we we bring them back up to their original 1961 boundaries. And so it, it, it basically would just follow what the boundaries looked like in 1961. I guess the question is if you had a if you had an urban area that's kind of on the border or close to a border between two districts, you could imagine that the catchment area for labor is in both districts. Right. So so you're worried about people moving across the border and 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 right. And so so that's that could that could happen. And then as I as I mentioned um, on my previous slide and talking about the context, there's there's not too much of that going on. But but I agree that that could that could very well happen. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Um, so the next the next data set that that is important for us is the data on on weather, right? So we use temperature and precipitation data from um, from this source, and this you, so be, because of the time period that we're looking at, we're going to be using monthly data. So this is satellite data at at grid level, um, and so we're going to have monthly data that spans 1951 to 2011. Okay, so what we do with this data is that we construct district level temperature and precipitation measures. Um, we follow sort of the, the, the standard in the literature. We, we use inverse distance weighting of the grid points within 100 kilometers of a district's centroid. And we restrict uh, to the agricultural growing season months. Okay, so these, this spans June to February. And so these are the, the months of the year where agriculture um, largely takes place in India. And once we have those monthly weather variables, we then aggregate them up to 10 year averages. We also use several other data sets. I'm gonna just you know, um, go through this very quickly just to, uh, for those of you who might be interested, we will be sharing, sharing this data once, once the paper is published. Uh, so we, put, we, used, we used data from the VDSA, um, the basic statistical returns, as well as index of labor regulation and data on bank openings. Because a lot of this goes into our sort of mechanisms component in the paper. Okay, so what does this data look like? So what I have here is a summary table of the data from the census um, broken down by each of the census years. And so uh, several things I would like you to take away from this. The first is that we see that temperature is steadily increasing um, over the decades. Um, and and this, this increase is, is steeper in, in the last three decades as opposed to the previous decades. When it comes to rainfall, we don't see a, we don't see a monotonic pattern. Uh, average growing season rainfall uh, seems to be shifting around a little bit across the decades. We also see an increase in the agricultural labor share and the non-agricultural worker share over time. Okay, so one thing I do want to mention is that these two variables here are not, uh, you know, not complements to each other and they don't necessarily add up to one. And the reason for that is we don't include cultivators when we are thinking about agricultural workers. Okay, so we, we, we focus on wage workers in agriculture. And so here, when we have agricultural labor, this is excluding individuals who identify as cultivators in the census. I um, mean, I'm happy to talk more about why, why we chose to do that, um, as well as tell you about robustness if we would put them back in. Um, but just for those of you who are looking at these numbers and, and wondering why they don't add up to one. We also see uh, an increase in, in urbanization over time, which, which is um, well established. Okay, so let me let me show you what these what the data looks like in pictures before I get into some of the regression results. Okay, so what I have here um, is the difference between growing season temperature in 2011 and 1961. So you can think about the two, the start and end points of our data. And we've plotted this for all the districts in the country. And so what, what do we see? We see that um, the changes in temperature are pretty heterogeneous. Okay, we do see that, that the, there are larger increases 
inland as opposed to um, in the coastal regions. Whereas when it comes to rainfall, we sort of see that there, there appears to be greater changes in rainfall along the coast. When we look at some of our outcome variables, so we look at the agricultural labor share here on the left, the non-agricultural worker share on the right, again, we see um, heterogeneity across space, similarly for urbanization and migrant share. Okay, so I don't expect you to take away too much looking at these pictures, but what, I, what we did do, um, you know, which was a starting point for this project is where we simply took um, these variables and plotted them against each other as purely raw correlations. Okay, and so what we have here um, on the horizontal axis is the change in the 10 year average growing season temperature. So again, the difference between 2011 and 1961, and we plot that with the change in non-agricultural worker share. Okay, and, and we start to see this negative correlation showing up between these two variables. Okay, again, this is just purely correlational. Uh, we haven't added any controls into this relationship. So using this as a starting point, um, let me now tell you about our empirical specification before I get into the results. So we're gonna use two specifications. The first is a panel fixed effects model. Okay, so this is going to be what we call our medium term response to warming. Um, and what we do in this specification is we're gonna exploit decade to decade fluctuations in weather. Okay, so just to, just to be clear, what we have, um, you know, we have the four different outcome variables that I outlined when I told you about the data. So that's gonna be um, the log Y on the left-hand side. And then we're gonna have temperature and precipitation, which is gonna be the average temperature in the growing season over the past decade ending in year T. Okay, and likewise for precipitation. And then we have a, a set of fixed effects that, that are important to understand. So we have our district and decade fixed effects. And we also include time varying region or state specific effects. So either uh, time trends or, or region year fixed effects. Okay, so what this does is it's gonna account for unobserved factors that may be correlated with climate or local economic patterns over time. Okay, um, in terms of how we treat our standard errors, we're gonna show you two sets of standard errors in all the tables. We're gonna cluster them at the district level. And we're also gonna present Conley standard errors that allow for spatial correlation up to 500 kilometers. So the identifying assumption in this model is that conditional on this rich set of fixed effects and in controls, any remaining variation in decadal temperature and precipitation is essentially random. Okay, and so we're gonna interpret this beta um, and, and gamma coefficients as sort of medium term responses to, 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 to higher temperatures and, and changes in precipitation, okay? So that's our first model. And our second model is gonna be the long differences model. And this is gonna be uh, what we're gonna use to, in, to interpret the long, long term responses to climate. Okay, and so here we're gonna exploit variation in long term climate trends. Um, and the model that we use here is very much uh, in the same spirit of the long differences regression that's used in the seminal paper by Burke and Emmerich in 2016. Okay, so what we do is we essentially take the difference in our outcome variable here on the left-hand side, it's gonna be the difference in our Y variable between two 30-year periods. So we're gonna take the average between 1991 and 2011 minus the, the average between 1961 and 1981. Okay, and here um, the identifying assumption is that conditional on these region fixed effects, any long-term changes in temperature and precipitation are likely to be exogenous with respect to our outcomes of interest. And so here we're gonna think about this beta LD as our long-term response to warming. And an important insight that we can, we can get from these two different models is that by comparing beta in specification one to our beta LD here, we're then gonna be able to understand whether or not there is adaptation that has taken place or there's an intensification of effects that has taken place. Okay, again, this is, this is something that has been done 
in the literature. Okay, so now let me get into the results. Um, so I'll first, so first I'm gonna show you the results in the medium term. So looking at the panel fixed effects model. Okay, and so what we see here, um, if we just focus on say column two, looking at the agricultural labor share, is we see that temperature, rising temperatures leads to an increase in the share of the labor force engaged in agriculture. Okay, I do wanna spend uh, a minute just talking about precipitations. Some of you might be wondering, you now I've been talking about, I've been focusing on temperature, but we also know that that rainfall is, in, is, is an important factor um, that impacts agriculture. Okay, and so what we find is that um, the coefficients on precipitation are, are, are pretty much insignificant throughout. And so um, this is again, consistent with work in, in, in climate change that has found that these temperature effects are more important over these time periods. Okay, so, so moving forward, I'm gonna just focus on the coefficients on temperature, but we do have precipitation in all of these regressions that we run. Um, and so taking, taking these results, right? So what do we see? We see that rising temperatures inhibit structural transformation. So inhibit the reallocation of workers from agriculture to non-agriculture. Okay, and these effects that we find are economically meaningful. So what this would translate to is a one degree Celsius increase in temperature implies that the share of the labor force to engage in agriculture increases by 17%. And the share of the labor force to engage in non-agriculture declines by 8.2%. Okay, so that's the result on sectoral uh, reallocation. And when we look at spatial movements, so movements from rural to urban areas, we don't find any significant impacts. Okay, so we have no detectable impact on urbanization and on rural to urban migrant share. So once again, this result is consistent with work done by Henderson and co-authors looking at climate change on urbanization in sub-Saharan Africa, and they find a similar result where they don't see these average impacts on urbanization. What's okay. the difference between the bracketed standard errors and the standard errors in parentheses? Great, thank you. So the, the, the standard errors in these brackets here, those are the Conley standard errors that allow for spatial correlation. So here we simply have district uh, the clusters at the district level, and then we have the Conley below that. Great. So um, in, the, in, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into showing you the results using the National Sample Survey, but we find uh, very similar results using that data. So a question that, that often uh, one might think about when thinking about a developing country setting is that workers are, tend to work in multiple sectors across the year, right? So work in, in agriculture is seasonal, and so it's common for workers to be engaged in multiple activities across different sectors within a year. And so what exactly are these effects that we're picking up? So what we do to try and understand this a bit better is to decompose our um, effects on the agricultural labor share into two uh, subcategories, which is found in the census. So the census has main workers and marginal workers. What is a main worker? It's someone who's worked for more than six months in the reference period. So you can think about this as someone who's, who works in agriculture full time or, or who has, whose primary occupation is agriculture. And marginal workers are those who've worked for less than six months in the reference period. And so you can think of them as you know, more short term seasonal workers. And so what we see is that this adjustment, um, this increase in share of agricultural workers as a result of rising temperatures seems to be coming from both the main and the marginal workers. Okay, so it's, it, it's an adjustment along both workers who engage in agriculture just, just part-time, as well as those who are now engaged in agriculture full-time. So again, we find similar results when we use occupational status in the National Sample Survey. Another, another question that often uh, one might think about is, are there non-linearities? 
So the literature has documented nonlinear effects of temperature. And so what I mean by that is that damages from, from rising temperatures appear to intensify over a certain threshold. Okay, so um, because we're using monthly data, we don't, we don't exactly have the, you know, the best test for this. And you typically think about growing degree days and counting up the number of days above a certain threshold. But we do what we can, which is to decompose our results in, 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 in two different groups. Okay, so we're gonna think about the districts in our sample and split that into districts that uh, what we call are less hot districts, which are districts for whom their average growing season temperature over the time period for which we have temperature data, so 1901 to 2014, is below the median in the sample, and districts for which the growing season temperature over this time period is above the median. Okay, and so what we see is that um, it appears to be that the effects are potentially stronger in the, in the districts that are hotter, um, though you know, we, we caveat this in that these coefficients are not statistically different from each other. And so what we, what we uh, want you to take away from this is that the patterns appear to be consistent with, with previous findings that damages may intensify above a certain threshold, though it's not, it's not a smoking gun in our setting. You, you get a, a question yes. again, a couple of questions in the chat. Were you able to look at not just mean temperature, but distribution or variability of temperature? Because um, you could imagine the climate change effect here is not just the increase in the mean, but increase in uncertainty in some sense. Right, but, but, but remember we're, we're, we're taking 10 year averages. So we're, we're sort of thinking about temperature over these 10 year periods, right? And so you could think about some of that variation being captured in these averages, but, but that's a good point. We, we've only uh, used means, but I would be curious to hear what people would like to see um, instead. Thank you. Great. So let me move on to now telling you about the effects of temperature in the long term. So this is using our long differences model. And what we find is that the estimates are, are substantially larger in absolute value. Okay, and so what this tells us is that the adverse effects of rising temperature appear to be intensified. And so sustained warming is making reallocation infeasible for a larger share of households. Okay, so just to put this into context, um, Burke and Emmerich look at this question in the context of US agriculture, and they find little to no adaptation to warming, okay, depending on the specification. But the takeaway there is that there doesn't appear to be adaptation. What we find is you know, this sort of uh, even more adverse um, effect, which is intensification of effects over time. Okay, so now let me get into the mechanisms, which I think um, is quite interesting. <laughs> but, you know. um, so you could think about multiple mechanisms that could be underlying these effects. Okay, and, and, and by it, in no way is this an, a fully exhaustive list, and I will be happy to hear uh, what other mechanisms people have in mind. Okay, so the first is that uh, there's a relative difference in labor productivity loss across sectors. Okay, so rising temperatures could lead to a relatively greater productivity loss in the agricultural sector. And so you would expect labor to flow out of the agricultural sector, okay? So this is not what we find, right? We find, we find the opposite. The second um, is local demand, demand effects. Okay, so rising temperatures lead to a reduction in agricultural productivity. Uh, this subsequently leads to a decline in farm incomes. And this then generates a reduction in demand for non-agricultural goods and services, and subsequently a reduction in demand for non-agricultural labor. The third main mechanism that we're gonna consider are liquidity and mobility costs. And so you could think about the cost to reallocation being non-zero and a reduction in farm incomes could inhibit the ability of workers to afford these costs. Okay, so you could think about these costs being, you know, simply transport costs, or you could also think about costs that arise from informational frictions, credit and savings constraints, et cetera. Okay, so, so we've sort of uh, ruled out the first mechanism um, getting into the next two mechanisms. The first thing we do, uh, even though this has already been well established in the literature, is to first just confirm the temperature yield relationship in our setting. Okay, so we look at the effect of rising temperature on yields and we find that 
indeed, rising temperatures do lead to a decline in yields. Okay, so this is the basis underlying um, the mechanisms that I outlined on the previous slide. Next, we look at heterogeneous effects using two different proxies for development. Okay, the first, um, a little bit of a bias towards my previous work is looking at how effects of temperature vary based on road connectivity. And the second, uh, looking at how it varies depending on access to formal credit. Okay, so we're gonna do a simple uh, heterogeneous regression here. We're gonna interact our temperature and precipitation with a dummy variable that takes the value one if you're a district with above median road density at baseline and uh, or you're a district with above median bank credit per capita at baseline. Okay, and so if local demand effects were to play a role, you would imagine that effects would be intensified in places with stronger price effects. So those are places with, with uh, sparse road networks, with limited market access, as well as in places where it's harder to smooth consumption. So you could think about uh, limited access to bank credit as being a proxy for those places. Similarly, if liquidity and mobility costs were to play a role, you could imagine intensified effects in places where the effective cost of switching is gonna be higher. Again, uh, you could think of sparse road networks and limited access to bank credit as, as proxies for these areas. Okay, so the first heterogeneous results are gonna be by road network density. And so what we find here, so the way we wanna think about these regressions is um, the, first, the first row is gonna be the effects of temperature in places with low road density. And the sum of the two coefficients are gonna be the effect of temperature in places with high road density. Okay, and so what I have here in the, in the table are the, the p-values of the sum so that you, know, you don't have to do the, you don't have to figure out in your head if the sum of these two coefficients are different from zero. Okay, so what do we find? We find that all the adverse effects that I documented um, in, in, in part one are driven entirely by districts um, that have below median road density. Okay, and so again, these are just proxies for development. You can imagine many other things being correlated to, to having a sparse road network. Similarly, when we look at heterogeneity by bank credit per capita, we find similar patterns. So again, we find that the adverse effects on sectoral reallocation are driven entirely by districts with below median bank credit per capita. So looking at this, this first row here, um, as opposed to the sum of these coefficients, uh, we see that these p-values are all greater than 0.1. Okay, and so what this tells us is that both of the mechanisms that I laid out before could potentially be at play here. So now we take this one step further and we say, okay, let's try and disentangle these two leading mechanisms. And so we do several things. Um, so for the local demand effects, we do two checks. The first is we're gonna look at consumption. So we're gonna look at total consumption, food consumption, non-food consumption. And so you would imagine that a decline in consumption would imply a reduction in demand for for farm and non-farm output. Okay, so that's the first test we're gonna do is look at impacts on consumption. Next, we're gonna look at impacts across different sectors. So we're gonna look at non-agricultural worker shares in tradable sectors in construction and manufacturing, as well as in non-tradable sectors, the services sector. Okay, and so you could think about the non-tradable sector as being more susceptible to local price effects, and so we would find, we would expect to find a reduction in services if this mechanism were to be at play. When it comes to the third leading mechanism on liquidity and mobility cost, so if it's truly the case that, you know, a reduction in income is driving this inhibition for, of workers to, to afford these costs, you could imagine that these effects are gonna be concentrated um, among workers for whom these constraints are more likely to bind. Okay, and so how do we how do we test this? We're gonna look at two different proxies. We're gonna look at cost and we're gonna look at educational attainment. Okay, and so if we think that these costs play an important role, we would imagine that the effects are gonna be more concentrated among lower caste workers 
lower educated individuals. Okay, so these are the tests that we're gonna do. So the first I'm gonna first I'm gonna show you the results on consumption and on sectoral worker shares. So what we find in panel A is we find a reduction in, in total consumption. We also find this reduction in both food and non-food consumption. And when we move to panel B, looking at worker shares across different sectors, <clears throat> we see that the decline in worker shares appears to be concentrated in the services sector. Okay, it's, we do see negative coefficients on construction and manufacturing. So, so we're not saying that um, you know, there, there was absolutely no change in those sectors, but these coefficients are not statistically different from zero. And so we find that the greatest reduction in worker shares appears to be coming from the services sector, so the non-tradable sector in these economies. Okay, and so what these results tell us is that this is consistent with this local demand effects mechanism playing a potentially important role in explaining what we find. Okay, so now moving to the third mechanism. Um, here, we're gonna look at heterogeneity by social grouping and by education. So in panel A, I split the results for non-scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. So we typically think of scheduled caste and scheduled tribe groups in India as a proxy for low caste individuals. Okay, and so, so this is the low caste individuals. These are the, the higher caste individuals. And we see that the effects are pretty similar across the caste groups. Okay, so we don't find um, big differences across the, across the columns. Similarly, when we look at effects for individuals who have low levels of education and high levels of education, we find that these effects are again, quite similar across education levels. So what we conclude from this exercise is that it doesn't seem to be the case that the liquidity and mobility cost story has, has a lot of bite, okay? And so um, we also consider several other mechanisms, okay? So we think about the fact that rising temperatures could on its own have a direct impact on the non-agricultural sector. Okay, and so to rule this out, we look at <clears throat> the effects on both rural and urban non-agricultural worker shares. And just to give you a quick preview, what we see is that the reductions are coming only from rural non-agricultural worker shares and not from the urban areas. So if it were the case that, um, you know, negative effects of rising temperature really affect the non-agricultural sector, we should see it across both rural and urban settings, and we just don't find that. Another mechanism that one might think about is that this reduction in agricultural productivity could lead, could lead to some sort of land consolidation. And so we mechanically find this increase in agricultural workers. And so if this were to be the case, then we should also see a reduction in cultivators in this setting. Okay, so when we look at results for cultivators, we actually find something quite similar, right? So we see an increase in the share of cultivators uh, with rising temperatures. So it doesn't seem to be the case that um, there's, there's a land consolidation story going on. And finally, you could think about rising temperatures leading to a shift in cultivation practices, perhaps towards more labor intensive crops. And so as a result, again, we would find an increase in agricultural labor shares. So what we do is we look at um, the crop areas that are being grown and we see, um, we don't see an increase in, in labor intensive crop areas. In fact, we see, we see a decline in, in labor intensive crop areas. Okay, so I know I've gone through all of this very quickly because I'm, I'm trying to stay on time. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna skip through the robustness. It's um, all in the paper if you're interested, but let me take this last minute to conclude. Um, so previous work has demonstrated that individuals reallocate across sectors in response to short-term weather shocks. And what we do in this paper is analyze medium and long-term effects in order to understand how agents are gonna respond to slow onset changes in climate. So we find that higher temperatures inhibit sectoral reallocation and effects intensify 
over a longer time frame. And these effects are particularly acute for individuals that live in underdeveloped areas, even within the same country, right? Um, so what this, what this highlights is the need for interventions that make agricultural incomes less susceptible to high temperatures. And it also suggests that public infrastructure could play an important role in facil facilitating private individual level adaptation to climate change. So I'm gonna stop here um, and I'm gonna be very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Yuhita. Really interesting, really fascinating, a great context in which to look at this question um, with such a long panel of census data. A number of questions in the chat. Um, okay. Maybe I'll start and take them a little bit out of sequence. Uh, Marcus Poshka had a, has a question that relates to, to mechanisms. <clears throat> you showed some results, but Marcus, did you want to did you want to go ahead and ask your specific question and also say a little bit more about what you might have had in mind? Yeah, it's, it's a very simple question, and like if you haven't done it, maybe it's because it's not possible. But uh, um, your your mechanism really is about you know you you have this temperature change, and then you argue that uh, basically relative incomes change <clears throat> sectors, and people move in response to that. Um, yeah. But apart from yields, you haven't shown anything directly about these relative incomes, right? So I was wondering mm -hmm. whether it was possible to, to get at that in a more direct way by either information on, on wages, wages. Or incomes in, in these sectors. Yeah, so we, we tried to do that. <laughs> we tried to do that. The, the wage data is, so what we have um, in terms of wage data is from the NSS and, and it's super noisy. So we weren't really getting... Um, anything that was that was very consistent. Um, but we can definitely go back and 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 try. That was, you know, I it it always each project has such a long <laughs> runway that I can't even remember what we what what the real issue was, but um, I can definitely go back and, and and think about that. I wonder if perhaps the cost of cultivation data might have some agricultural wage data. I don't know if they would have enough on non-agricultural wages or incomes, right? but that might be worth a look as well. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Um, a couple of questions about, um, again, about the, um, so a question from Dambala about the potential, I think, for using non-parametrics and machine learning Dambala, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, really, really, it's very great job and very interesting. And, uh, but my concern is the full picture would have been uh, captured if uh, more the analysis subjected to machine causal forest analysis. Uh, these, um, <clears throat> line promoted by Susan Eddy, and uh, it really captures very interesting broader set of uh, uh, heterogeneous effects and mm -hmm. um, interacting uh, variables with, uh, with temperature. Yeah, I, I think, agree, uh, I agree, absolutely. So it's so one, one limitation that we faced, um, you know, with the heterogeneous effects is that we need measures at baseline. So we need you know, what we used were, were road infrastructure in 1960s or the, the bank credit in 1960s. And so we don't have a ton of variables that, you know, we could run through uh, one of these uh, models and try and predict which would be the most interesting. But but I, I fully agree that, you know, these were two that we, um, you know, I'm being perfectly honest here, we had good data for. And so that's what we went for. But um, I agree that that would have been a very interesting exercise. Uh, did we try to kind of figure out effect of temperature variance instead of the level per se. Does that make sense? How does Yeah, that so I think this is what came up earlier as well with, with Doug's question. So, so what do you have in mind? Like, what would you like to see? Yes, yeah, like maybe variance is kind of, kind of, it may represent because temperature is affecting income and uh, its variance is going to be representing kind of a certain way income, income risk which is kind of, kind of uh, feed into behavior, maybe extended behavior. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In addition yeah. to direct relationship between yield and temperature, 
uh, the variance is affecting the, the production decision. Right, and right. In areas where I think liquidity constraint, I mean, borrowing insurance is missing, I think that could be another uh, right. Uh, channel. Right, and I think this is exactly what the, the short run impacts look at, right? They look at these fluctuations, like if you have really high rainfall relative to, to the average. Whereas when we're thinking about these climate variables, we're looking at these long-term averages. And so we're thinking about sort of more slow onset changes. But, but I agree, I think this is something that I need to think about, um, think about harder as well. Thank you for that. Yeah, that would be good. And uh, is it possible to get a copy of this paper? I'm very much interested. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, if you if you just Google my name <laughs> and go to my okay. website, it's it's or, okay. or any of my co-authors, you know, it's it's there. All right. Okay. Good. Good job. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Krapat has a hand up and uh, go right ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, so I think uh, so. Two comments. One is that uh, you know, as the like you know, with the green revolution and new seed varieties, uh, you know. Uh, that would be interesting to explore a little more. But the second one is um, on this, uh, you know, paper by you probably know uh, Ram uh, Fishman and David Black. He has this uh, AER paper about how in Karnataka uh, the uh, groundwater going down, then uh, how uh, this uh, ag households are able to find off farm employment and it increases. And that is kind of a, like it, like in first glance, it looks like the results are like a bit different, uh, uh, mm -hmm. even though the setting is quite like similar, you have a you have a shock where people cannot adjust, cannot diversify their crop, etc. But I think the the the, the com they, they basically complement your paper in the sense that Karnataka is a probably much more developed and the road density is much higher, which is one of the mm -hmm. headwinds. So yeah, so I I think like it might be useful to bring that paper also uh, to in your discussion. I just skimmed through your paper. Yeah. You have cited that paper, but that's that's pretty good paper. I, I think like both results, even though they look like they are not uh, like in one in their paper, the off farm employment is increasing. Like, like people are adopting by migrating, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, here, like if you look at the whole country data, it is not true. So that's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. aspect. And and are they looking at at sort of short term or what's the time frame over which they are looking at? I think it's pretty uh, relatively long term, not super short term. Okay. But uh, I think the the nice thing in their paper is this natural experiment where uh, the bore wells, uh, the groundwater bore wells, when they fail, that is kind of a random process. Um, okay. so, yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. No. I. I have to admit. I. I don't know that paper too well, but I will definitely take a look. But you know, the 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 two things that you brought up, the green revolution and groundwater, those are you know things we have in there as as, as time varying controls and robustness. But um, you know, I think you're you're thinking of maybe thinking about it more deeply and not just as you know throw it in as a control. But how how does this result contrast with what we find and and why? Did you have something specific about the green revolution in mind? So, or? No, so I main thing I, I was, uh, yeah, so like if uh, more climate adaptive uh, seed varieties are being available in some areas, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you can bring in that data, maybe not in this paper, maybe in future work, but that might be, mm -hmm. you know, useful. Um, um, I think it's kind of a the blanket approach that people are not diversifying their crop in response to these climate shocks. Uh, mm -hmm. It requires a little more digging in. Uh, India is a whole big country, right? Like in different areas, like as like again, like with with Fishman paper, like you know, if you look at Karnataka state, uh, they found like something else, uh, uh, like kind of different results uh, for a similar type of shock, right? So uh, yeah, so that right. that's where I I mean like you know probably digging further. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, we should we should talk offline. We could write a paper together. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So Yogi, if if I can ask you to return to something you actually brought up. Um, mm -hmm. which is the question of cultivators versus agricultural wage workers. I saw that in some of your, the later results, you were using cultivators yeah. as well. And I wonder if you could yeah. talk a little bit about why you, why you left them out of the initial analysis and whether you think the results are sensitive to that in any way. Yeah, great, great. Thank you for bringing me back to that. So, uh, you know, the, so we really wanted to focus on wage workers as we thought these are the workers who are going to be responding to these you know, reductions in agricultural income. There, there's been a lot of work in, in, in India and other settings that show that 
the mobility of cultivators is a lot more limited, you know, partly because of land market frictions, partly because of other other um, other frictions. Um, there's also a, a data reason for why we don't include cultivators. We don't have um, the shares of cultivators for the full sample um, as opposed to the other outcomes. But if we were to throw cultivators back in, like you see here, so in, in panel B, we have the, the main ag labor share that I've been using throughout and throw back in the cultivators, the results are pretty similar. So, so there isn't, isn't too much uh, going on that's different with cultivators, um, but we chose to, to restrict our attention to wage workers in agriculture, um, but we find that the effects are similar. What we did find quite interesting is uh, if we look at the heterogeneity just for the cultivator sample, we don't see that similar heterogeneity that we did with uh, the ag workers. And so I think this is what, so what we see is that there's an increase in the cultivator share, both in places, um, well, actually, no, am I saying the right thing? We see that the effects are, are strong in the um, places with low bank credit, for example, but you know, these coefficients here, um, don't tell us that there's any difference between the two, right? And so it seems to be the case that, I mean, even though these p-values are not significant, so I should be careful with, with what I take away from this, but it seems to be that the heterogeneity is slightly weaker with cultivators, which, which makes sense if you think about these are individuals who are, you know, shackled to their land, they're unable to move, even if they, they were hit by these shocks. And so we don't see as much movement um, with this particular group. Thanks. Um, Idosu has a, a question. Um, Idosu, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself. I, I think it's a, an interesting question. I'm not sure it's one that it we'll be able to make much progress on, but please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. And thank you, Yogita, for uh, great work and interesting topic. Uh, I just wonder, uh, the channel you are highlighting, the domain channel that the told uh, like justify the, uh, the, the labor force not flowing from agriculture. Uh, we, we need the relative chair of the demand for non-agricultural goods coming from the farmer to be relatively important within the economy so that the channel you are highlighting can play right in my sense. And my question is, do you have a sense of this relative chair? How important is the relative share of the demand for non-agricultural goods that is coming from the rural uh, areas or from the farmer basically. Because if the relative share coming from the urban or non-agricultural worker is high, we should expect to, to still have a growing demand from, for non-agricultural uh, goods. And then the, the channel, the mechanism you are putting forth would not play as well. So, so when you say relative here, you mean uh, like farmer population relative to the whole population or rural population no. relative to the whole population? These are, no? these are consumption or expenditure shares, I think is the, yes. the question sort of, is the, is the consumption share or expenditure share of the rural population for non-agricultural goods, does that need to be high? Um, or, does or, that need to be high? Yeah, I guess it's a this is sort of a, a hypothetical. This is a GE question, I think, that is <laughs> trying to anticipate, which may be beyond the scope of what you have here. But do you know anything about expenditure shares? Maybe just start with that as a short version of the question. I don't. I'm. I'm trying to think. Um, I don't think we do. I don't think we do. But that's something. That's something that I'll put down to look into. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll have to think about this point. Yeah. Other other questions. I had a, a question about the you know the maps. I guess. <clears throat> When you put the maps up, they had me more worried than after the analysis, but okay. because the maps show a lot of spatial correlation, 
mm-hmm. and, and the coasts in particular. And I was worried that you might be picking up coastal versus non-coastal. Um, you, you obviously have the, the um, region controls in there, but I was just curious whether you looked at other sort of controls for uh, coastal versus non-coastal. <clears throat> I mean, in some question. ways, the, the, the rainfall is, is control is capturing a lot of that. But. Mm-hmm. I, I, we did think about this. I, I wish I could, you know, it's 1230 in the morning here in Singapore. So I'm going to, I'm going to forgive myself. But um, I would think one, one check that we did do was to drop the coastal districts and see what the results look like. Um, but I know we have a better answer for this one. We did think about this quite hard because of the way it showed up. I'm, with with the fixed effects, I think we we you know take care of some of it, um, but but we do we did think about that. I just can't remember. No need well. to apologize. It was an impressive paper and an impressive presentation, Thank especially you. for post midnight. <laughs> I had my coffee, so I'm all set. Great. Well, I think if there's no other if there's no other questions, we've got um, just a couple of minutes between papers, but we'll start right up again. I just want to say thank you, Yogita. I think this is a it's a really important contribution. I think it's a paper that speaks to an issue that we're really just trying to wrap our heads around, and certainly something that Steg is interested in. These kind of longer term effects of climate change on patterns of structural change. Are, are something that policymakers are very conscious of, and I think as academics, anything we can do to shed some light on this is important and interesting. So many thanks. Thank you. And Thank you. Uh, thanks for a great and clear presentation. Um, so on that note, I'm gonna turn the chair over to you, Joe, um, for the, the next full paper. Um, we have a minute or two, but we can just- now Let's take a couple right minutes. In. Okay. People can run to the restroom or get a drink or whatever it is very quickly. Fantastic. Okay, welcome back. Um, we continue uh, with the next paper by uh, Lucas Zavala, uh, on tra- Trade Monopsony Power in Agricultural Value Chains. Um, Lucas, do you want to uh, share your screen? Yes. Um, Again, people can unmute for clarifying questions, but um, otherwise uh, type your questions in the chat and I will handle them at the end. Okay. Um, So I've got my slides in front of me and the camera off to the side. uh, So when I'm looking over at you guys, it's not going to look like I'm looking at you guys, uh, but I promise I, I am. Um, okay, so thank you for, for having me. I want to thank first the, the organizers. Um, I was looking down at the, the number of participants, and I think that this is the, the most people I've ever had um, on, a, uh, on a talk. Um, so I think that's kind of one of the upsides of, of doing things virtually, um, that a lot more people can see your work uh, in many different time zones, like past midnight in Singapore. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to talk about monopsony power in agricultural value chain. Um, And I think this is pretty easy to motivate to this room. So two thirds of the world's poor work in agriculture, uh, even in in 2020. And so the division of surplus between buyers and sellers in these uh, value chains is going to be important for development. At the same time, exports from developing countries remain concentrated in agriculture and other uh, sort of commodities, um, and and the key feature of those markets is that large exporters, in many cases, connect smallholder farms uh, to global markets. Uh, so that already kind of the, creates the potential for these large firms to take advantage of their size um, and and potentially uh, depress farmer income. So that's exactly what this paper is going to tackle. So first, I'm going to ask: To what extent does this exporter market power drive farmer income. Um, and I'm going to focus in particular in, in Ecuador, sort of as a, as a case study of, of some of these issues. And second, can policies like fair trade, which are sort of increasingly popular in this setting, uh, help farmers to benefit from globalization? Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm going to tackle this question in the context of Ecuador, uh, which is where I, I have sort of access to this really great administrative data 
which I'm going to argue allows me to link exporters to farmers. Uh, now I'm not going to capture, you know, every single uh, farmer, and I'm not going to to, to claim that. Um, but I do think it's going to allow me to to see uh, sort of some important patterns. Um, once I have connected these exporters to farmers, I'm going to establish a few key facts. So I'm going to show in this data set that farmers receive uh, very low income. And I'm going to kind of link that to the concentration or the size of these exporters uh, in those uh, sort of export oriented crop markets. Um, so to kind of get from these uh, cross sectional facts to a sort of measurement of monopsony power, uh, I'm going to use a model um, which is going to link that monopsony power to kind of two key dimensions of um, of decisions made by farmers. And that's gonna be which uh, crop to produce and which exporters to supply conditional on the crop that you've produced. So it's gonna be kind of the simple model linking the market power um, of the exporters to these sort of two key decisions of farmers. Um, here's where the trade context I think is really nice uh, in this paper. So that's gonna help me a lot with the estimation because these exporters are going to be kind of large in the domestic market, but then turning around um, and much smaller, at least um, on, the, on the international market. Um, so that's gonna allow me to estimate, kind of drawing on this, on this uh, lit pass-through literature, uh, kind of back out these uh, key elasticities of switching crops and switching exporters within a crop from um, pass-through of, of international price shock. Um, and then in the last two parts of the paper, I'll, I'll answer those questions. So first on the measurement side, to give you a preview, I'm gonna find that farmers receive half of their marginal revenue product. And this is accounting for some of the other things that exporters do. So the, the sort of value added, um, uh, if you will. And then kind of answering that second question, um, I'll run a couple of policy counterfactuals. Uh, the key one is going to be this kind of fair trade certification program, uh, which I'll model in a couple of different ways. I'm gonna show that increases or has the potential to increase farmer income substantially. Um, and what I think is kind of cool here is that the model is going to allow me to compare that to some broader policies like uh, implementing say a, a, a price floor across all, all crops. So sort of a blunter um, policy. Okay, um, so I, I sort of mentioned these contributions already, but I'll just, I'll just go through, through quickly. There's a large literature, uh, growing literature on um, buyer power in agriculture. So sort of recognizing that these intermediaries, if you will, these um, firms that stand between farmers and, and sort of their, their larger markets um, do exercise some kind of monopsony power. Um, and what's, what I think is the, the kind of the, the nice uh, new feature here is that I'm gonna have this rich micro data that links exporters to farmers. Um, and that's particularly important because it allows me to leverage some of these uh, trade tools uh, on the export side. Um, another thing that I wanna say here is uh, just on this last point. So there's kind of this uh, growing availability, I think, of these types of data. So I'm going to you know, drive my measures of this value chain from um, financial data, from tax data, essentially. Uh, and we're seeing more and more that um, countries and especially kind of developing countries are now starting to have the capacity to put together these data sets and share them. Um, and I think one of the cool sort of secondary contributions of the paper here is that um, I'm going to show how these, uh, these financial data sets and using these sort of very different tools from the agricultural trade literature um, still can produce some, some sort of estimates that are, that are in line. So I think that that sort of opens the door for using these data sets kind of you know, beyond um, tax purposes. Okay. So now I'll explain uh, briefly, and I, I think in general, my strategy here will be to be brief given how much time we have at the end uh, for questions. So um, I have a lot of buttons um, in the talk and, and I'll, I'll kind of explain briefly now how, uh, how I construct these, these supply chains. Um, so I'm gonna start with customs declarations, and that's gonna allow me to observe an exporter and the sort of crop they export. Now crop here is going to be a very general uh, term for this HS six digit, uh, if you're familiar with the trade classification um, of products. 
And that's going to include things like bananas, cocoa beans, um, you know, unroasted coffee, for example. Uh, but I'm also going to call a crop any sort of animal product. Uh, so, for example, uh, in Ecuador, the second largest um, exported uh, crop is, uh, is shrimp. So that's also going to be a crop, just to avoid saying animals and crops and so on. Um, okay, so I observe what these exporters are exporting, and I see both the value and the quantity. That's going to be really important um, later on. And then I'm going to link it to data derived from VAT receipts. So these are uh, filed by the exporter um, about the purchases that they're making from various suppliers. So in this sort of simple example, this exporter has two suppliers, and I'm able to see the purchases. Uh, now, what I would really love is to see the purchases and the quantity from each supplier, um, but, I, but I don't. So, uh, so you'll see uh, later on that my analysis will kind of collapse down to the level of the exporter because I'm, I'm not going to be able to kind of differentiate between P's and Q's um, of different suppliers. Um, so once I've linked uh, exporters to the suppliers, I'm now going to merge in data from firm registry and other tax information, so individual kind of income tax filings uh, from these different suppliers, and that's going to allow me to classify suppliers in a sense. So again, in this simple example, uh, you know, I've observed that one of these suppliers is in the agricultural sector and another is in storage and transportation. This isn't really a random example. Uh, the largest category of spending for these exporters is in fact uh, agricultural uh, firms in the economy. And the second largest is transportation and storage. So that gives you a bit of a sense of what else those exporters are going to be, are going to be doing. And that's kind of the, so I say value added kind of in quotes because it's not the traditional notion of value added where you're just focusing on labor. Um, but this is sort of the other things that exporters are doing besides just buying um, the crop and kind of turning it around to, to the market. Um, so now once I've identified those farmers or farms, um, I'm going to infer that what the exporters are purchasing from them are, um, in fact, crops. Uh, and I do a lot of um, digging into this, this data set, and, and I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, so there are details about, you know, domestic intermediaries that typically come up as questions. Um, and, uh, and I'm happy to talk about, um, you know, my confidence that, that I'm actually measuring something about the agricultural um, economy. Um, so just quickly, will, will we do the same thing with the monitoring? I can't really see the chat at the same time um, to, in, to kind of interrupt with. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, um, so who's actually uh, in this data set in the end? Uh, well, kind of reassuringly, these farmers, which later on I'm going to index by F in the theory, uh, these are small self-employed producers. Um, so one thing that's nice about them is because I have these other tax filings, I can see kind of how they're reporting themselves. So these farmers, they file, um, you know, disproportionately. So over 90% of them are going to file this very simplified tax form. That's basically what a self-employed individual um, would, uh, would, would file. Um, and so the interpretation there that I got also from kind of talking to the people that, that helped me put together uh, these data is that, that this is sort of a, a family farm. So that's kind of the, the interpretation of a self-employed taxpayer in the agricultural uh, sector. Um, so are we capturing you know, every single farmer? Potentially not, but, but, the, but the idea here is that we are capturing kind of some of, of what we think about as, as smallholder um, farms. Um, and I'll say more about that later. So, so the exporters now, in contrast, they're much larger um, and they're highly profitable and they're almost exclusively in the wholesale sector. Um, so that's kind of giving you a, an idea that these are sort of intermediaries buying from uh, local producers, you know, also purchasing some, some other um, inputs, combining those um, with labor and with that raw product and then turning around and exporting it. Um, then uh, in, in general, these crop markets, which I'll index later by J, so J would be like bananas or coffee or cocoa, uh, they tend to be dominated by, by very few exporters. Um, and so we'll see uh, later on with the, 
uh, with the facts, uh, how that, that comes into play. Uh, and then the last thing is that in general, these farmers are only supplying a single exporter, but the exporters are sort of sourcing from, from many different farmers. Um, and I have, you know, so, well, one of these other buttons uh, kind of shows that um, the, the sort of difference between larger and smaller exporters within a sector isn't that they're sort of ordering more from each farmer, it's that they're connected to many more farms. Um, so that's, that sort of helps um, inform the theory later on. Okay, so turning to the facts. Uh, yep. Yeah, sorry, I, I asked the question in the chat, but I, I think that's not working. So Yeah, um, I can't see the chat, sorry. No, no, no worries. Can you just, one, one thing I missed is you talked about the profits of the exporters. How are yep. you inferring these profits? Is that just residual from kind of value added? Uh, they pay from... Kind of the customers and then the export value or is that kind of is there more involve, involvement in, in getting this uh so later on there will be a notion of profits you know in the the theory this for now is just kind of accounting profits so it's just you know i see what they export um they're 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 mostly exporting i mean i see overall sales which is what allows me to to see that so they're mostly selling um internationally and then i'm just subtracting off you know, the sum of all of their domestic purchases, all of their wages. So I, I don't, I didn't talk too much about this because I'm not going to, you know, lean too heavily on the, on the wage data, but just, um, it's just kind of subtracting out all of their, all of their financials. Um, so they sell basically a lot more than they spend on the sum of crop purchases, other non-crop purchases, and with the wage bill. Okay, um, so I have until 10 after, great. Okay, so uh, moving to the facts, I'm going to show you that these farmers um, receive low income and I'm gonna link that to that, that high concentration of exporters uh, in crop markets. Um, so first to do that, I'm gonna define sort of this analog of the labor share. So we're kind of used to thinking about the labor share is how much the uh, workers are paid kind of as a share of the firm's sales. So I'm just gonna define that same thing for this sort of farmer. Um, so the, the way that that goes is that for an exporter I of crop J, the farmer share uh, is how much they spend on crop purchases divided by their overall sales. So a farmer share of, uh, of one in this case would be that, um, you know, there's no, literally no value added and they just uh, turn around and sell the same product for, for sort of the same price internationally. So what does this graph show on the X axis? It's the farmer share of export value. Uh, and on the Y axis, the sort of share of exporters in each bin. Uh, and this blue line indicates that for every dollar that exporters earn, farmers earn less than a quarter. Um, now, obviously that could all just be from value added if everything that you know what the exporters are doing between labor and, and other inputs adds up to that other 75 cents, um, then, then we wouldn't have an issue. Um, but I'm going to argue that even kind of within a crop, you'll see this variation that's not fully explained um, by value added and later on um, uh, explained by the model. So to do that, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna define something else that I'll sort of referred to as exporter size, um, but it's it, it, in a way it's like a monopsony market share. Um, so you wanna, so we're gonna think about of all of the purchases of crop J in the economy, so the entire kind of domestic market for crop J, how much does exporter I purchase of that? So this uh, exporter would have, um, you know, size one or market share one, if they purchase the entire market for the crop, and uh, close to zero if they're really, really small relative to, uh, to that crop. So here I'm plotting on the y-axis, that farmer share of export value from the last uh, slide, and then on the x-axis, that relative exporter size. And what this tells us is that farmers are earning around 60% less selling to the largest exporters uh, versus selling to, to the smallest exporters. Uh, now this uh, graph is just sort of you know, to, to help visualize. Um, so this is just the, the sort of raw uh, bin scatter plot. 
Um, but I show in a series of regressions that this doesn't seem to be driven by value added um, or kind of rough measures of quality. So, so here I'm just sort of doing this in a regression framework and let's focus on this third column. So um, again, the dependent variable is the log of the farmer share and the independent variable is the exporter's relative size within the sector. And here I'm controlling for crop year fixed effects. Uh, so this isn't driven by certain crops having very high value added and others uh, not. And I'm also explicitly controlling for some of the things that I observe. So the, the spending on other inputs and labor, and then also this uh, output price. So remember that I can see both export values and quantities. Um, so the idea here is to kind of say, you know, take two exporters um, that are selling for kind of a similar price on the international market, um, add a similar, you know, spend a similar share of their, of their sort of uh, inputs on, on these other inputs. And one of them is just much more dominant in the sector. And it turns out they're, they're paying around 50% um, less to the, to the farmers um, connected to them. So of course, this all remains kind of cross-sectional. And later on, this, this kind of time series moment of the pass-through of international price shocks is really going to help me uh, identify the model. But, but first, um, let, me, let me present that, that model. OK, so it's going to be a pretty simple theory, I think, um, which is nice. Um, so farmers are going to choose crops and exporters. Exporters are going to have market power in this model. And then that market power is going to be governed by exactly the parameters that kind of underlie the farmer choice of crops uh, and exporters. Um, so I've got 20 minutes. OK, I have to do some catching up. Um, so farmers choose a crop to produce, and within that crop, they choose an exporter to supply. Exporters buy one crop from many farmers. They add some value, so there's going to be value added in here, and they sell it internationally. And then those crop markets um, are going to be oligopsonies in Ecuador, so uh, very, kind of a finite number of buyers within Ecuador, but then competitive internationally. Uh, and, and underlying that is the idea that you know even these these very dominant exporters within Ecuador are very small on, on global markets. Um, okay, so farmer F uh, is going to kind of have some, you know, exogenous land, and then what determines their yield for a, a given crop sold to a given exporter are gonna be these, these uh, that land multiplied by these kind of two shops. So these are gonna be the key parameters that come up again and again throughout the rest of the talk. Um, so there's going to be a shock for producing a given crop. Um, that's gonna be governed by theta, which I'm gonna call the substitutability, elasticity of substitution across crops. Uh, and I'll, I'll show later that that kind of links to some, some measures of, of land quality. Um, and then there's going to be this, this shock for supplying a given exporter within the crop, and that's going to be governed by eta, the substitutability of exporters uh, within the crop. And I'm gonna link that later on to um, to measures of trade and search costs. So what these farmers do is they trade off the prices they see, so that's this PIJ, so that's the price that exporter I offers for crop J, they're gonna trade off those prices with idiosyncratic shock. Um, so that, that could you know, then lead to, to this situation where you know, a farmer receives a very high shock for uh, producing a given crop, but because the overall price of that crop is low, they instead uh, produce something else. Uh, and that's important because that's what later on will kind of lead to you know, potential efficiency gains from, from uh, removing uh, exporter market power. So now the exporters, uh, they have some productivity and then uh, they also have this kind of very simple production function. And this alpha here, the output elasticity of crops is going to help capture value added, right? So when alpha is really high, then you need a lot of crops uh, to, you know, a lot of crops purchased domestically in order to export. And so that's very little um, scope for value added um, and vice versa when, when alpha is low. Uh, so they receive these kind of exogenous world price shocks and they're maximizing profits. Um, and so the key thing here is that the exporter internalize their influence over prices. So they kind of, 
take into account that when they offer a certain price, that's going to um, determine the trade-off that, that farmers make. And that's, that's kind of what's at the heart of the market power here. Um, and then the, the market's just clear. So what the exporters purchase from, from their whole set of farmers adds up to, to, their, to their total uh, offered at that price. Um, okay. So um, just to, to kind of fill this out a bit, um, the, the sort of math behind, behind these shocks is going to be this kind of familiar nested low chip math. So the idea is that eta governs the shock for reaching exporter I within crop J and theta the overall shock. Um, and so the, the, the sort of choices of the exporter or of the, of the farmer, the probability that they choose exporter I of crop J is going to have this um, kind of a nested structure. Uh, and what this implies here is that the higher is this eta, so the more substitutable are these exporters from the point of view of the farmer, the more that the exporter price drives the decision. Um, so that's sort of a, a, a natural um, way of thinking of this. And then uh, similarly, for the crops, the higher is theta, so the more substitutable are these crops from the point of view of the farmer, the easier the farmer can switch the more that the overall crop price index is going to drive their decision of, of, where, to, of where to produce. Um, great. Uh, I've sort of said all of this, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that. Um, so now exporters are going to set prices strategically, given their production function and the kind of supply curve that's aggregated up from those farmer decisions. Uh, from those uh, choice probabilities. And what that will give us is that is this kind of closed form for the, for the farmer share um, that's going to be a, uh, a product of that value added term and this sort of supply elasticity of the, of the supply curve. Um, so this immediately tells us those two possible determinants of the low farmer share that, that we saw in the data. One is that exporters add a lot of value and the other is that they have market power. So they face um, a really uh, steep uh, supply curve. Uh, and here's where I'm gonna draw on this, this sort of nice trade results from Atkins and Burstein and, uh, and show that actually you can now write, um, assuming Cornell competition and, and later on I'll, I'll do Bertrand as well, um, and these kind of CES supply curves aggregated up from farmer decisions, you can actually write this in closed form where um, the farmer share is going to depend only on this alpha, the value added term, those two elasticities of substitution and the exporter size. So this is telling us that the farmer share is low if eta and theta are low. So concentration is going to be worse for farmers if it's very costly to switch crops or exporters. Um, so that's, that's sort of intuitive, right? Because the more costly, the less substitutable these crops and exporters are, the more that the, the exporters can kind of squeeze farmers before they're going to, to switch to, to another option. Um, and then finally, as long as it's easier for farmers to switch within crops uh, than across crops, that farmer share is going to fall with exporter size, um, which is sort of what the data is telling us and what it will tell us later on. Okay, um, great. So caught up uh, mostly. So now to estimate this, I'm going to take advantage of um, the, the sort of small open economy nature of Ecuador and use the pass-through of international price shock. Uh, so I'll, I'll say this briefly, but the basic idea here is that as um, eta and theta begin to, to, to differ, you're going to have both incomplete pass-through. This is kind of a, the, the standard variable um, markups, or in this case, markdowns, because we have monopsony power result, um, where as these elasticities differ, you're going to have both incomplete pass-through, and in this case, uh, it's going to decline with, with exporter size. Um, and it's kind of going to decline more um, as the, the difference between, between these parameters um, grows. So the intuition there is that exporters are internalizing that upward sloping supply curve, right? So they know that when they receive, say, uh, a positive price shock and they want to expand their domestic um, demand, so they want to purchase more domestically, they know and they internalize that that is going to raise the price of every other inframarginal unit, 
So that makes them less responsive um, to those shocks. So it kind of dampens their response, dampens the pass through, and disproportionately so um, for, these, for these large exporters. Um, so I don't directly observe the prices of the farmers, um, but with this, with this sort of um, production function set up, it, it turns out that actually I can still get, get some idea of the change in prices just by looking at the sort of the difference between um, the, the log change in spending on farmer inputs and the log change in the output quantity. So the idea there is, uh, you know, to export 50 kilograms of coffee, you know, I have to purchase, you know, something like 50 kilograms or some sort of fixed share um, of that um, of that quantity. So, so these sort of changes are still informative of changes in price. Um, so what I'm going to do is regress this sort of measure of the, of the log, uh, price change on the, on shocks to the international price and that shock, um, interacted with the exporter size. And so what the theory tells us is that this, um, coefficient is going to be less than one. So that's the incomplete pass through. And then uh, this coefficient is going to be less than zero. And I've highlighted these in green and purple because they're kind of um, that, that sort of which coefficient is informative of which underlying parameter. So that kind of baseline pass through is kind of more informative of the substitution patterns across exporters, um, whereas the, the other one is more informative of um, substitution patterns across crops. So briefly, that's just because, you know, if you think of a very large exporter, uh, they don't face much competition within their crop, right? So their pass-through is mainly disciplined by that switching across crop. Uh, that's basically the intuition um, um, in a sentence. Um, so how am I going to get from these coefficients to those underlying parameters? I'm going to use indirect inference. So I'll construct those price shocks, and that's uh, pretty standard using ComTrade data. Um, and other specifications as robustness. I'm gonna estimate that pass through in the data. Um, I'm going to simulate it in the model. So in the model, these are kind of complex functions of those underlying parameters, um, eta and theta, and then I'm going to match those. Um, so I can click through a lot of the buttons later on, uh, but the, the basic idea here is um, what I wanna point out is that these values in the data uh, are indeed less than one and, um, and negative. So pastor is incomplete and declining as the, the exporter size within their crop grows. Um, and these are, are kind of the parameters we, we get out of it. Um, okay, so the one thing that, I, the one button I do wanna click on and then I can come back to this later is uh, that these estimates of eta and theta they have, they kind of map back through that theory of discrete choice to um, parameters in the agricultural trade literature. So, um, so this setup does kind of map into this idea of land heterogeneity from a number of, of papers and the kind of dispersion in land heterogeneity. And so one thing I do is kind of convert my theta to that, that implied parameter um, sort of standardized across a number of papers and it's, it's sort of within the ballpark and similarly, um, that eta maps into a, a, a kind of iceberg trade cost or iceberg search cost um, across exporters. And so I, I sort of map that um, and, and, and show that it's within, within the ballpark as well. Uh, and notice this is a completely different, you know, not, not spatially, um, not particularly spatially rich source of variation where these other papers are really um, are really very, very uh, spatial in nature. Um, okay, I, I can go over this later on. Uh, so now let me turn to actually answering the two questions I posed at the beginning. So on the measurement side, uh, just first as a benchmark, I'm gonna ask what if exporters were perfectly competitive? Um, so here I'm showing that if I removed those, those sort of markdowns from the international price to the, to the farmer price. Um, so if I remove that monopsony power, farmer income would be 70 to 80% higher. And that's pretty stable across the Bertrand and Corneau um, specifications. 
And um, that would be kind of split between redistribution and efficiency gain. So the redistribution here is from all farmers now earning their marginal revenue product, right? So it's not that their price is not depressed below the, the sort of international market price. Um, and then some additional gains from efficiency. So this was the point I brought up earlier about once you remove those markdowns now, say uh, a farmer that you know, potentially chose um, cocoa wood in the new e equilibrium, um, choose something where they had, where they had a, a, a higher shock, but where the, where the price had been sort of relatively more, more um, depressed. Um, I look at heterogeneity. So the largest gains are in the most co concentrated crops, not surprisingly. Um, and then hopefully I can talk about this more later, but um, you know, the kind of two alternative explanations in the background here are insurance and sort of this idea of fixed costs. So I have uh, some evidence um, in the paper that it's not fully explained by those. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm happy to go into that in more detail um, in the question. Okay, so just to, to make sure I get to the policy, um, the, the, the sort of measurement and thinking about perfect uh, competition is, is a far cry from actual policies in place to fight monopsony power across the world. Uh, and one that's gaining in, in popularity is this sort of fair trade policy or related certification programs for sustainable farming. So these have a lot of components, many of which have nothing to do um, with, with the economics of, of these markets. Uh, so I'm gonna focus on these two, I'm gonna model these two sort of uh, components. So one is this focus on disadvantaged producers. So really thinking about what we're doing for smallholder um, farms that are linked to global markets through um, large intermediaries and this idea of fair payment. So trying to rectify that monopsony power with fair payment. So how am I gonna introduce that in the model? Um, so kind of stripping away, you know, a lot of the notation, what's happening for the typical exporter, they're maximizing, you know, some, um, some profits that are going to depend on their productivity, that quantity that they purchase of crops, um, that value added term, and then the price um, that they're paying. So this P is a function of Q, that's kind of the, the, the market power um, idea. And then what that yield is that the price they offer to farmers is lower than the marginal revenue product of farmers on the international market. So now I'm going to introduce this exporter who does not do that, who's basically competitive. So takes that, so faces the same supply curve, has the same sort of techno access to the same technology as the normal exporters, but is not internalizing their influence. So they're at behaving competitively. And so that leads um, instead that that uh, that exporter is going to offer farmers uh, a price equal to their marginal revenue product. And that sort of flexibly captures, I argue in the paper, some of the ways that fair trade is implemented in practice. Um, so you can think of this as kind of allowing farmers to group together and export directly, some share of them. Um, you can think of this as a limiting case of that exporter maximizing not just their profits, but some average of the profits and farmer income. Um, so this is some of the ways that that fair trade has has been implemented and and sort of and sort of modeled. So these kind of um, sustainability conscious consumers that don't just care about um, you know getting something at the cheapest price, they also care about the sort of price that's paid uh, to producers um, upstream. And so this way of capturing it. Um, also kind of lines up with the literature on fair trade and that it raises income through two channels. So there's going to be a direct effect, which is that this price is higher than, um, than the price of a similar exporter who has market power. And then there's this kind of indirect effect, which is that because you're introducing an especially competitive uh, firm, that's going to kind of discipline the market power of, of other exporters. Um, so the overall effect is going to depend a lot on the productivity of that new fair trade exporter. So here on the x-axis, I've kind of graphed that, that productivity sort of relative to the baseline. Um, and then on the y-axis, the percent change in farmer income. So um, what this means is that if this new fair trade exporter has the median productivity level, um, it would increase the farmer income in a given crop 
uh, by, by around 12%. Um, and that's mainly going to be driven by that direct effect. Um, here in the dash, it, I can go into this in more detail as well, um, is the sort of effect if that exporter did not behave uh, competitively. So there's something sort of special about the, the fair trade versus just increased competition. Um, now, governments spend billions of dollars supporting much broader uh, policies supporting farmers, such as minimum crop prices. But it's well known sort of by analogy with the minimum wage literature that this can create uh, distortions for in the, in the presence of, um, of market power. So there's sort of this direct effect that all exporters now have to pay at least the minimum price, so that's good. Um, and at the same time, there's this indirect effect in that some, especially low productivity exporters, won't be able to afford that minimum price. Um, so they'll sort of shrink. Um, there's not really exit in this model, but they kind of shrink to become so small and that reallocates um, toward, the, toward the larger exporters. Um, and so that's going to kind of act in the, other, in the other direction. So fair trade exporters, another way that that is kind of implemented is through a specific price floor. So this is not a price floor that, that's, that all exporters are subject to, but only those kind of fair trade exporters. So now I'm gonna com compare this sort of broad price floor versus, versus the, the specific one for fair trade. So the dashed line here um, kind of shows the percent change in farmer income in the model as you vary the minimum price uh, within the kind of baseline distribution of prices. Um, and then this blue line is kind of saying, what if uh, what the percent change would be if you had a, uh, a minimum price that only that fair trade exporter was uh, was subject to, and I've just set that at the at the median of the price distribution. So what this is telling us is that the fair trade at the median price is equivalent to a much broader floor at the 78th percentile, and that's because the fair trade having a a, a fair trade policy is not distorting the, the behavior uh, of other non-fair trade exporters in a way that reinforces uh, market power and sort of counteracts that direct effect that we saw was so strong. Um, okay, so just to conclude a little bit over time, um, I've shown in this paper that farmers receive a small share of the surplus from international trade that exporters exercise substantial monopsony power over those farmers, and that fair trade has the potential to increase farmer income without creating some of the distortions of, of these broader price-based policies. Um, and then, you know, just to emphasize, um, you know, once again, that I've kind of come to this, this conclusion with uh, a very different data source from the, the sort, of, sort of typical, um, typical data used to, to think about uh, agriculture. And I think that, that kind of opens the door for, for using these, um, these more broadly available data sets uh, going forward. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Lucas. That was, a, it was excellent. That was a really nice blend of model and data to quantitative analysis to address a, an important uh, macro development policy question. So um, I really liked it. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm in, again in the poll position where I get to ask the first question, <clears throat> and I was kind of curious about um, why you looked at shares rather than just directly at the price, let's say the log price of the input, as my concern is just that with costs, uh, I guess there's some costs that it seems that you might have left out that are going to show up in the share that wouldn't show up in the price. Um, some ones that kind of like the literature is emphasized, like fixed cost of exporting, <clears throat> maybe setup costs of exporting that are, you know, dynamic, you know, paid early uh, inventory carrying costs. These are sort of like important costs of exporting that I could see. And so why not just go directly at the price that the farmer gets and then, and of course, express it later on in terms of shares, but do all yeah. the. Um, so I have done that. I think the, so the main re I, yeah. So, so this kind of goes back to something I mentioned briefly, which is that 
I see kind of the quantity at the port, but not um, otherwise. Um, so to, so I mean, one thing I could do is kind of divide the farmer's payments. So like the value by the, the sort of export quantity, um, which could be different, right, from the import um, quantity. And, that, that, and that's something I have done. Um, and the idea there, so, so it's, so these, these exporters, the larger exporters do pay higher kind of nominal prices. So the idea, you know, if you, if you picture kind of that exporter moving up the supply curve, so they are paying a higher price, but they're also kind of paying it at a, at a wider markdown. So it's kind of, um, uh, both things happening at the same time. And the reason I guess is, yeah, I guess I, either way, there are maybe expositional um, issues. So that kind of, that, that, that sort of involves already having a, a price measure that is sort of like your cost, like your purchases divided by your output quantity. So it's not really a price, um, but, but maybe that, that is easier to, to digest. Um, but, but yeah, so the, the, the basic idea is, they are paying higher prices, um, but they are much more kind of uh, profitable. So it's sort of, they could be paying even higher prices is the, is the idea. But I, I guess that, that I guess going again to the, the measurement of costs, that kind of hinges in making sure you get the costs um, kind of correct. I guess, um, Deanna um, Van Patten, uh, you had a question, a related question about sort of measurement in terms of these exporters, um, do you want to un unmute? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Lucas. Uh, thanks hey. for the paper. I, I, I like this paper very much. Um, so my, my question had to do with, uh, I don't know how it works in, in Ecuador, but um, at least in Central America, like large exporters, Dole, Chiquita, they don't only buy from local farmers, but they also own their own farms. And so all that quantity that is producing those farms is going to, affect your estimation of the price that these firms are paying because you're going to divide by a large quantity that might be coming from those farms. I don't know if that right. happens in Ecuador, but if it does, it's something that you might want to, to consider. Um, yeah, so one of the buttons uh, is about direct exporting. So, so I don't see too much direct exporting by um, by um, by farms, uh, and and the the there is sort of an exception, which is the industry for cut flowers. So that's kind of those farms. They kind of happen to be very close to the airport. This is a high value to weight product, and so it's really easy for those um, flower farmers to export directly. So those those are kind of excluded. Um, I had a kind of similar concern, also especially uh, after reading your, your paper. Um, but actually, it turns out that there was a movement in like the early 2000s to kind of divest um, even these sort of in these sectors that we think of as being dominated by multinationals like Dole and Chiquita. There, it's a much smaller market share even within um, within within Ecuador. So, so I guess I wouldn't. I'm not sure I would be able to. I guess. Yeah, I guess then what would happen, I guess what you were, what, what you would, what you would say there is that if I sort of observe Dole and Chiquita as, uh, say, an exporter, and then, you know, they are also owning their own farms, then maybe some of what I'm calling wages is actually, uh, you know, payments to, to farmers. Um, so another thing that I've, uh, that I've done not for the full model, but for these stylized facts, if you include the direct exporters, um, the sort of farmers exporting uh, or, or agricultural firms exporting, which would be very large, and you kind of include their wages, so a sum of their kind of payments to upstream agricultural firms and also uh, kind of to their wages, it doesn't, it doesn't really change those, those facts. Um, but I haven't sort of done that for the full estimation. There were a, a few related questions about sort of, um, what, you know, 
where the source of the market power might come from, why there's not entry, and, and why farmers might still sell uh, to big exporters. Um, Russell Morton, uh, Nezi Gunner, and, and Paco Buera, do you guys want to unmic and maybe I sort of feel like they're kind of related, so maybe you want to take all three and then kind of answer them, Lucas? Great. Why don't we start by Russell? Place finalist, that's great. Oh, thanks for sharing this, this paper. I was just curious about what are the kind of the sources that are preventing exporters or kind of new competitors from, from emerging in the export uh, for the exporters and why is this appear to be differential by crops from understanding kind of that, that graph you showed earlier that had the downward sloping progression line. Uh, Nezi? Yeah, the, uh, one reason the farmers might want to sell to large uh, exporters might be some kind of a credit relation. So they could maybe, these big firms allows, uh, help them to smooth consumption. They could borrow maybe for what they're going to sell in the future. So this kind of credit relations will, in, will not show in the price, but it will have an additional value. Paco? Maybe we lost Paco. Are you there? Um, that looks like let me just read it. He says, uh, related to Nezi's point, it could be that large exporters are less risky and that they're buying every period. Um, and is that, an, is that a benefit of selling to the large exporter? Yeah, so let me, um, so, I, so I don't have an answer directly to this idea of credit, but there's sort of an, a, a related idea, um, which is, you know, if you look at the two facts that I sort of laid out or that I'm uh, sort of relying on for, for estimating the model, one is, is sort of this cross-sectional fact that um, these large exporters are paying um, lower shares. And, and then the other is this kind of time series pass through fact, um, right? So another way to interpret that is as a measure of insurance, right? These farmers accept a you know, lower um, income or price in exchange for sort of smoothing of those shocks. So another way to think of lower pass through is, is kind of a smoothing of those shocks. Um, so I have uh, one, one thing that I can check directly in the data, um, which is sort of how they respond to different types of shocks. So this is kind of that same pass through um, regression, but now I'm adding kind of this triple uh, interaction and, and sort of uh, similar to the, to, the, um, to the keynote this morning, you know, once you start adding these, these um, higher and higher uh, order interactions with a smaller sample, you lose a lot of precision. But, um, but here I'm, I'm also, so I'm, I'm interacting that um, price shock with the size and also with an indicator for whether that's positive. Um, and what this, this sort of last column tells us is that there's kind of a differential response to positive versus negative shock. So it's not the case that these uh, exporters are kind of smoothing both shocks. This is kind of saying, oh, when there's a positive shock to exporters, you know, they're kind of um, adjust, you know, they're increasing their markdown, right? But when there's a negative shock, um, there's going to be kind of higher, uh, more pass through of that negative shock. So, uh, you know, at least, uh, you know, I think this is one way of, of thinking about kind of, of uh, the, the sort of, well, it's not credit uh, exactly, but it's sort of this, this uh, intertemporal um, smoothing of, of risk that exporters um, might, might provide. Um, now, uh, the other, so that's, that's sort of what I have to say to, to Nezi and, and, and Paco. Um, and so about this first question, which is some of the barriers that, that could differ. Um, so that's not, that's not something I tackle so much um, in this paper, but, uh, but I have some related work where we're basically looking into um, the role of trade policy in, in this setting. Um, so, 
So, you know, having these, these kind of um, costly certification programs um, or these explicit quotas or sort of sanitary standards um, could, could be um, something that, that is a sort of policy barrier. Um, and, and kind of an important, an important thing here and an important reason to think about fair trade is that this is something, this is sort of a relatively new policy. Um, so it's really taken off in the sort of the last 10 years. Um, and, and I didn't mention this, but these data are, are more, are from kind of the, um, from 2008 to, to 2012. So it's kind of before the takeoff of these, um, certification programs, which are, you know, in a way kind of overcoming some of those, uh, those barriers. It was a, a quick follow-up question, and then we'll, uh, we'll have to move on. Um, Jonas had mentioned, and I also had the question about sort of like when it comes to the fair trade, <clears throat> actually, I don't know, maybe fair trade's more recent in Ecuador, but fair trade's been around uh, for decades, but in terms of the world, um, sure, but yeah. how big are these fair trade producers? Because there's a sense that they're they're relatively small. I guess I have a concern that maybe that indicates that there's some costs, there's, there's some capital expenditure costs that are needed to get larger or something, but how, how big are there and how does it compare with kind of the model in terms of the counterfactual? Um, so, yeah, so one thing is the size of the kind of intermediary and the other is the, the size of the, the producer. So, so this was the, this was uh, this point here that a lot of these fair trade policies in practice actually have a limit on how big the certified farm can be. Um, so the idea is to certify kind of small um, farmers um, and, and kind of specifically focus on, on those smallholder farmers. So it's not, the idea isn't, okay, now this, you know, massive like factory farm is, is certified. Yeah, I meant, just, uh, I meant more the exporter and the share of the market. Yeah. Um, so one thing I do there uh, is to kind of benchmark that uh, against, so just by kind of introducing these, so that's going to, how big this exporter is, how much of the market they capture is going to vary with, you know, well, in the model with how productive they are or in the other specifications which with how high that minimum price is um, but I can kind of compare that to the micro literature um, so there's this uh, really uh, great paper um, by Dragusanu uh, and Nunn that kind of looks at fair trade I think maybe it's in Costa Rica uh, I don't remember but it's um it's a fair yes, trade paper yes. it is right okay Great. Um, and, uh, and so I kind of validate, this is at the median productivity level, um, kind of those, those effects. Um, cause I was shocked. I mean, they seemed really large, like 12% income increase, but the basic idea there is like the income's so low to begin with, it's not hard to, to increase it much. So, so what you're looking for is this last part. So quantity certified. So that median productivity exporter captures about 20% of the market, which is sort of in line with, um, with that micro um, literature. Um, and I think it, it, so that, so the way you started the question kind of connects to one of the other ways to think about this fair trade working, right? So in the background, um, I haven't modeled this here, but some of these other papers about fair trade um, think a lot about the demand side of fair trade. So, you know, you have these uh, consumers, um, you know, when you go to a coffee shop or to the supermarket, maybe you prefer to buy the fair trade over the, the kind of Maxwell House uh, variety of coffee. Um, and those uh, studies find that, that consumers are not very sensitive to the price. Um, so, they, so basically, consumers really like that things are produced in a, in a sustainable way and that farmers are, are sort of getting good livelihoods. Um, and so that's sort of, I think, some of the power of, of, of fair trade, which is that, um, you know, the, the, it's sort of 
by analogy with the tax literature, that that in, the incidence of fair trade is is kind of on this very insensitive um, cons- price insensitive consumer, and that is what's sort of the technology of it that you know th- that is going to help kind of overcome um, some of those costs of of say coming together um, as uh, as farmers to to export directly. Okay, thank you very much, Lucas. Uh, it was a, a very interesting paper, and I hadn't uh, seen you present anywhere, but I, I'm impressed. So, um, thank you. Let's, Mandy. Thanks do you want you. to? Uh, you're welcome, uh, Mandy. Do you want to take over now that we have another speed round coming up? We have actually two speed rounds coming up with a break in the middle that will allow people to continue conversation. Uh, you know, after the first speed round, um, but we urge you to come back for the second speed round. Just to finish a sentence that was uh, brought up by a good point was that I think all regions that are land abundant and very agriculture based, that this generates a natural floor under the wage. It is true of Latin America and true of Africa. Um, So I would agree with the point, but I would say, nevertheless, Latin America has been more successful in exporting than, than Africa has. Great, thanks for, for answering in the last two. Hey, uh, Nancy, I had a, a follow-up question related to one of the previous, which what's your, if you think that the wages in the formal sector in Africa are, uh, I'll say in quotes, too high, what is it that's actually keeping them too high? If, if they're higher than in the informal sector, a worker from the informal sector should be happy to take a job in the formal sector at a somewhat lower wage. What's what's preventing that from happening? Um, uh, to to some extent, it's a matter of the, the it it's it's the fact that anybody who's dealing formally with big money with any of the, there's big money and there's small money in these countries if you're anywhere in the zone for big money you're going to deal with the government and the government is going to be controlling so I, I was amused by some of the papers the other day talking about search costs i you know nobody searches if you want to do business in these places you in big business you go to the government. That's your first stop. If it's not your first stop, it's your second stop. Um, What what does happen, and I think you're bringing up a a big, and and the government can make sure you pay that big wage. They can control that because they control your permission to exist and do business in the country. The multinationals, you pay or they'll find somebody else. What, uh, What I think, and you raise an interesting point, is that Given that there is this margin, you know, this is the the Airbnb of Africa, that there are companies that can register and be formal and thus they qualify for government contracts and other things. Once they get the business, they subcontract to informal firms in order to pick up that cheaper wage. Um, So there's there are constraints that stop formal firms from paying any less uh, for for workers, the way that they get access to the cheaper wage is to hire uh, hire an, a, a technically formal firm, which will then subcontract to an informal firm with cheaper workers. I, I actually also wanted to ask a question on on your paper, if uh, if it's okay in this time. Uh, because it was it was really interesting that there were two things. What one was uh, sorry. What uh, one was uh, you, you talked about um, uh, the move from agriculture into uh, urban informality uh, being something that you has not only become very dominant but increasingly dominant. But I wondered if you from your data you also knew anything about. Uh, duration of employment once people move it into urban informality is there because i think it sounds as if you're able to some extent to track individuals is there any 
uh, elevator by which people spend a little bit, you know, sort of Harris Todaro style elevator where people spend a little time in urban informality and then move on to maybe larger informality and eventually end up in the formal sector. Or do people, or a large amount of people anyway, get really stuck there once they are, and, and sort of there's no path on. And the second thing I just wanted to say was you, you emphasize a lot about firms not wanting to become formal because of high uh, labor costs. And I, I also wondered, I, I would assume that another reason why firms would avoid formality would be high taxes. And I wondered it, how those two things compared in terms of importance based on your experience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on the last point, absolutely true. They are also avoiding taxes. Um, and uh, related to labor, um, because the, the higher tax rate and the higher wages is basically, it, the government creates these rents by these artificial means and then they dish it out. It's, they're just divvying out. Um, we focus our surveys on firm owners, on entrepreneurs, and not so much on workers. Most surveys are about workers or households. We follow the entrepreneurs. And um, I think basically what we have found, and with, with the informal businesses in Africa, they, they, they have a low lifespan, but people are constantly um, uh, winding up one business, they start another one. I mean, tracking them over time is really very difficult. They constantly dissolve and then reconstitute under a different name, sometimes because the tax collector found them. So they just says, oh, well, that firm no longer exists. And then they'll just make another one that has another, another name. So I can't say that we followed the workers very well. What we can find, what we do, what we suggest in terms of recommendation is if you're if you're trying to get firms to formalize, then focus on the big ones, because those are people who already know how to function in the big game. And they probably also have a fair amount of protection. They're just ducking and hiding. So, you know, those you can go after because they they have the, the capacity to, to survive better. The other is is don't do so much rent concentrating. It's a, it's a bad idea. And part of this includes uh, government officials who are silent partners in businesses where they're in their day job, they create the rents for it. So there's, there's a lot of things in terms of governance and economic management that should be, should be improved. What the little guys need is also better economic management, better governance. They need better access. And Louise made a number of these points. They need better access to infrastructure. They need better quality infrastructure. They need better access to government services. They need a more honest government procurement practice. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can do for them that won't necessarily formalize them but will help them raise their productivity. Um, very little of this falls in the realm of credit. Everybody wants to push credit on these guys. That's not what's important. They need more services, access and quality of services, things the government can provide. And that will move them along this spectrum in that slide I showed very briefly. Productivity rises the more characteristics of formal firms you tend to adapt. The more you're like them, the higher your productivity, you can move them along the spectrum and eventually hope to sign them up. That, that was also something that I was interested to ask and is really interesting. But I wanted to, is there also, a, what is the kind of intensive margin effect as well between the largest informal firms and the smallest formal firms? Do you, do you notice a sort of jump in productivity once firms become informal or are the smallest are formal firms quite similar in terms of productivity to the largest informal firms? Um, what we find is that the largest informal firms have productivity that's close to formal firms. It's still less, but it's close. And the, 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 other, the other margin that you're talking about is um, um, it varies by country. And um, let's see if I can... I don't know if I can get this back, but whoops. Um, we need to share screen here for the coming breakout room, the, the new session. Sorry yeah. about that. 
Okay, sorry. So um, anyway, I don't know if you if you're seeing this slide and or not, but in any case, um, this this gradation we find the fundamental structure is the same everywhere, but the um, uh, but the um, uh, but the shape varies by country. Um, so. Uh, so I, you know, no, it it varies by country. Every country is a little bit different. <laughs> it, it's a good question. Frankly, we spend most of our time on that explaining how we get around reverse causality, and so I all of that's in the old literature. You can look it all up. <laughs> I guess we should get started. I think we're supposed to be starting now. Um, the last session of the day uh, is Yusuf Neggers. Um, Yusuf, you want to share your screen? Uh, he's going to be um, presenting on updating the state, information acquisition costs, and public benefit delivery. Um, so uh, go ahead. Great. Um, can You guys can see everything and hear me okay? Perfect. Uh, and it, um, I know that uh, Charity, who's one of uh, my co-authors on this project, is here. She'll be um, away in the middle and then back. So maybe if you have any questions, you know, feel free to put them in the chat, but also feel free um, to interrupt me with those questions if it's during the point in time when Charity is not here. So um, great. So let's jump in. Uh, so this is uh, co-authored work together with Eric Dodge, who's now at ID Insight, as well as uh, Rohini Pandey and Charity Troy Moore. Yale University. Uh, we're really excited to be able to talk about this work in a venue like this. Uh, and also just want to say thank you to the organizers more generally. So um, by way of sort of really broad uh, introduction for our paper and sort of maybe a useful fact to keep in mind um, is that, you know, right now there's more than a billion individuals in developing countries who are, you know, participating in social protection programs of one kind or another. I think you can think about this being a large part to countries like Indonesia or India that have transitioned from lower income to lower middle income status, um, you know, where you've got greater sort of government ability to provide those programs and still have really large numbers of individuals in the countries who would benefit from them. Um, I think there are two other things to keep in mind that are most often the case is that these sorts of programs are usually going to be administered through multi-tiered hierarchies of bureaucrats and or elected officials. And they're often, you know, we, we, you know, we have lots of concern about you know, the potential weaknesses in the way that these programs are being administered or implemented that, you know, for a given level of inputs is going to limit the benefits that, you know, poor uh, beneficiaries uh, receive from, you know, taking part in these programs. And understandably, I think the primary focus uh, is often on rent seeking by government officials and also potentially shirking. Um, you know, we certainly agree that that's likely going to be a very important uh, reason in, in most con you know, in many contexts. And I think this paper isn't trying to say, oh, that doesn't matter. We're just taking a slightly different focus on a different dimension that you know, will interact with say rent seeking or shirking potentially, but it can also matter in settings where those sorts of agency problems are not uh, first order concerns. And so we're gonna be thinking about you know, in, an, in a setting where you have understaffed administration, you know, what role does alleviating information acquisition costs uh, potentially play in being able to improve program performance? Um, you know, I think that uh, this recent paper by Dasgupta and Kapoor has this term that, we, you know, sort of fits our thinking nicely of bureaucratic overload uh, being in settings where you have that, by which they mean you have bureaucrats who are sort of, you know, vastly under-resourced relative to the responsibilities that they face. Um, and so we're going to be thinking about this in relation to the delivery of benefits in public in, in these uh, social protection programs. And so it's relevant then to, to also note that there's been a big push and a lot of uh, adv advocacy for this sort of push towards digital payment delivery. You know, so replacing in-person delivery of program benefits that are in kind or in cash to having you know electronic delivery into people's bank accounts. Um, and you know, the usual design is that you'll have that endpoint being digitized. So you've got the payment deliveries digitized, but you still have all these steps earlier in the process that very much still involve the humans, right? The bureaucrats and potentially elected officials who have to do things like identify beneficiaries, sort of supervise all the steps of, as things are moving around, you know, forms are being signed off. You've got your, you know, the funds transfers are being uh, authorized, et cetera. Those people are still very much there. 
Um, and so what we want to think about is, is there additional traction that you can get by thinking about a tool or technology that sort of is focused more on those remaining early steps where people are still involved in the administration of these sorts of programs, and in particular tools that potentially lower the cost of information acquisition for those administrators. Now, I think that you know, up front, it's sort, it's sort of ambiguous about the potential gains to be had from doing that. On the one hand, sort of the, 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 the glass half full sort of, oh, the you know, best, best case would be, look, you are in fact managing to reduce these problems of bureaucratic overload so that you know, officials for a given level of effort are able to achieve more. It's easier for them to say supervise subordinates, complete their own tasks, et cetera. And then that could then maybe lead to improved downstream program outcomes. On the other hand, if what you're doing is you're, you know, by easing information flows within the hierarchy, you're actually just worsening, say, problems of collusion, you might actually make things worse. Or third case could be, look, it just turns out that these information acquisition costs weren't a binding constraint in this setting. And so, you know, if you reduce them, you're not really going to see much of anything happen. Um, so we're going to be thinking about this possibility more specifically in the context of the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. Um, this is India's sort of massive rural uh, social protection program. Uh, it's a workfare program where if you're a rural household, you're uh, guaranteed technically up to 100 days of unskilled paid labor uh, per year. Um, you know, by virtue of the fact that it's occurring across India, it's massive in scale. Um, and the, the key thing I want to start keep, having us keep in mind that I'll return to in more detail soon is that you can think of the administration of that system really occurring within districts um, so that you can think of three tiers that are relevant of the hierarchy. So you'll have at the top level district level officials, at the middle you'll have sub district or block officials, and at the bottom you'll have sort of frontline workers or bureaucrats. Uh, and sometimes locally elected officials that are working out in the panchayats, or you can think of those for simplicity, I'll say villages sometimes as well. And it's also worth keeping in mind that you know, for, for a number of years now, wage payments in this program uh, to workers have been made electronically. And so what we're going to do is take advantage of what that means is in the background, there's a management information system that as, say, a worker finishes working and then um, things like measurements of work and the wage lists, et cetera, are working their way through the system, until ultimately that worker gets paid, um, we have access to data on as that's happening. So in real time, we can understand sort of for each, you know, each, you know, each, each work cluster as it's moving through there, we can know when it's happening, how long it's taking, et cetera. So we've got that metadata access. Um, and so what we, what we do is we use that to underlie an app that we created in partnership uh, with the Ministry of Rural Development um, in India and the and the departments, uh, the you know the, the the chiefs at the state level of Anrega uh, in two states of Madhya Pradesh and Jharkhand, um, basically to create an app that the goal is to make it easier for administrators at different levels of the hierarchy to gather inf information they need to understand, say, where delays are, are occurring, like at which steps, with which individuals, and which subordinate regions. And I'll discuss all that in more detail uh, in a few slides as well. Um, and we're going to evaluate the impact of this application um, using an at-scale RCT, so across the entirety of Madhya Pradesh and Jharkhand. Uh, we're going to examine how plausibly lowering these information costs can matter for payment processing, and actually as well as some tentative results on how that can matter for downstream work volume as well, um, and I'll, I'll talk about that soon. Now, what we're going to do is also vary the level of the administrative hierarchy at which we're providing uh, the Paydash app. Um, so we're going to provide it to either the upper level district officials, the mid-level sub-district officials, or both levels of the hierarchy. And we're going to use that to try to tease out the, the, the relative importance of, say, capacity constraints for that middle level of the hierarchy versus, say, agency concerns of, say, collusion or shirking that would involve that middle level of the hierarchy as well. And I'll talk, uh, give you know, sort of a really distilled version of a conceptual framework that shows, um, you know, why we think that this design lets us get at that. Uh, so to preview things, um, you know, we're going to find that the provision of pay dash to the upper district level or the mid sub district level uh, reduces payment processing times uh, by about 11 percent. Um, and we don't find uh, with a couple of different measures any uh, any evidence of adverse impacts on quality or corruption. Um, and as well, you may have you, you may in your mind think of, well, if you're sort of putting this tool in that changes information flows, perhaps there'll be spillovers onto, you know, other management strategies, the use of different sorts of performance incentives, et cetera. Uh, a tricky thing for us is it's very hard to, or that data essentially 
does not exist in any aggregated form as collected by the government. But what we were able to do ourselves is collect information uh, that was relevant to the intervention itself about officer transfers. And so that is transfers are an important dimension of performance incentives in this context. So we're going to find there a 10 percentage point reduction in the use of officer transfers uh, in, in areas where district officers have paid ash. Um, we are going to find some tentative evidence of increases in the days, uh, work days requested and worked um, of, on the order of 10%. I'm going to say tentative there because we are still in the process of getting in all the data there and cleaning it up. But I think that we're seeing, um, you know, this is what we're seeing right now, but I'll just asterisk it for now. Uh, we also find um, strong substitutability in the impacts of providing pay dash to mid and upper level officials, uh, su suggesting that the relaxation of capacity constraints for the middle level of hierarchy uh, is relevant in this setting. Uh, and as well, if we look at heterogeneity and impacts, we are gonna find that the impacts are really concentrated in areas that have high delays as defined uh, based on pre-intervention measures, um, where it turns out that those mid-level officers actually are responsible for supervising a much larger number of village units or panchayats, um, which we think is further points to the relevance of bureaucratic workload for that level of the hierarchy uh, as part of what's going on and part of why Paydash is able to improve, improve payment processing. Um, so let me give you all uh, you know, some, some context about uh, in regs and also the Paydash app. Uh, I would just say, you know, I know there's, um, given how we're digging into the details of the hierarchy, I've got to kind of go through it in detail, even, even when you've got a shorter presentation time. Um, so again, we're talking about the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. Um, it's massive in scale. Like I said before, you've got more than 50 million rural households participating yearly now. Um, in the fiscal year that we rolled out uh, our intervention, 2017, 2018, you see more than 2 billion person days being worked nationally. Um, and so what, you know, what, what happens after you complete a work spell uh, as a worker? So what you can think of the way that it typically functions, at least in the states in which we're working, is I, as a worker, will be working on a specific project. And there will be six day cycles, so work spells, um, after which, you know, then the process goes, of, there's then verification of the work that was being done, filling out of wage lists, people double checking that. So this whole machinery of work verification and payment processing kicks into gear, where what the government would like, um, is the central government, would is that I as a worker, after a six day work spell, should have money show up in my bank account within 15 days. And the government is going to officially split this into two different stages. So the first is stage one. These are steps that are the responsibility of these uh, village and sub-district or panchayat and block equivalently bureaucrats. And the government would like to see those steps taking place within eight days. And then you can think of there's like a funds transfer order that's signed off on and it's sent off to the bank. Then the government says, oh, that's in stage two. And that's where you know, you've know got a week, uh, the banks have a week in which they're supposed to disperse that money. Um, you know, Given what our app is doing and who we're providing it to, we're gonna focus on uh, the time taken and the variability of time taken uh, for stage one is our sort of main outcomes here. Um, so just to give you some sense of performance at the time that we were first conceptualizing this project, so it's compared to that 15-day goal, the average worker in India in, in fiscal year 2014 was waiting 53 days. And there's a lot of variation across states. In certain states, that was the, the average was actually as high as, say, four months. And this has been going down over time, but I will say, you know, in our intervention states at the time of rollout, the in the year prior there, the average time to payment was 27 to 28 days, so still almost twice as long as the government would have liked to see. Um, so let me give you some details then about, okay, what are these steps that are occurring after a work spell before workers get paid and sort of who's responsible? And then this will map to, your, to our thinking about what's going on if we provide apps at different levels of the hierarchy. So again, we're focusing on stage one and we can split that into two sub, -step, two sub stages. So the first would be stage 1A and these are the steps that involve those, um, you know, those bureaucrats and sometimes locally elected officials who are out in the panchayats themselves or the village clusters themselves. They're gonna be doing things like, okay, there's been a work spell has taken place. So they're gonna have say junior engineers evaluating the quality of that work, recording it in a measurement book. You'll have people checking the attendance list. And then they're gonna, the village level uh, bureaucrats will upload this into the, into the MIS for, for, for NREGs. Then it's, that is then, that information then is sent to the sub-district office. So now we're in the second part, the stage one, where you then have some officials who are further double checking the measurement book, the wage list, generating a funds transfer order, and then senior people at the sub-district office are signing off on the funds transfer order and then sending it off 
through the central government system to then hit banks that should then disperse the money. Now, I should mention that, so what you can see here is that village level bureaucrats and sub-district level bureaucrats are directly involved in certain steps of this process, but also the sub-district level is responsible for managing and monitoring um, you know, the performance of things at the sub-district and village levels. And then above the sub-district level, not directly involved in any steps of this process are district officials. So you can think of them as being a step removed. They have an overarching sort of management and supervisory role for performance at the district and sub-district levels. And then you say, look, you know, the funds transfer order has been sent off. It's routed through the central system, the PFMS, to banks, and then banks are supposed to dis disperse it. So again, we're focusing on uh, time, time taken for, for stage one here. Um, and that was just a figure to, to show what I was just saying. Um, now, it, given this structure, uh, what are the sort of issues when we may be concerned about in terms of agency problems or, or, or work overload? Well, at the local level, what we have in mind, uh, you know, based on contextual knowledge, is that village officials may, for example, be embezzling funds directly. So you can think about this well-known problem of ghost workers in NREGs, where say, I'm just gonna create individuals who weren't really there working um, who I can then bill and then you know get the wages for, for. or perhaps uh, officials are going to collude with workers. You can think about something like, oh, hey worker, let's say that you worked four days this week, you actually worked two days, and we figure out some way you know to to split the gains there. Or village officials may simply just shirk in their duties uh, of completing those steps in a fast way. Um, at the sub district level, uh, those officers know you know given what I described before, that they have this sort of overall supervisory role of village level officers and a sign off responsibility, which gives them some leverage uh, to hold over those village level officials and that also opens up the potential for collusion across tiers of the of the hierarchy here. And, and again to the subject sub district officials could also just shirk. I should have added that as a sub bullet here as well. And I should note then you can also think about it either one of these levels, um, it need not be that what is causing delays is that you know you have agency issues. It could be that these individuals are you know their their incentives are aligned with those of say district and state level officials. They want to get people paid on time. They just have too much to do relative to the resources that are available to them. Okay, um, and so I want to also mention they're going to be within the district and sub district levels. Two officer types of particular interest to us. One is going to be CEOs. Uh, we're using the terminology from Madhya Pradesh here. Uh, CEO, so the chief executive officer. Um, you can think of them as at a given hierarchy level. They're the highest ranking bureaucrat at that level. They're going to be responsible not only for NREGs, but a number of other programs as well. Uh, below them, you're going to have program officers or POs. They're the highest ranking bureaucrat that's solely responsible for NREGs. Uh, and so they're the, you know, they're typically going to be more heavily involved in program management and administration, and they report to the CEO at each level. So you'll have a district and a sub-district PO re reporting to district and sub-district CEOs. Okay, so let me give you guys, uh, you know, some information, some background about, so what do these officers look like? Who are they? Um, so, you know, columns one through four here give summary stats for district CEOs and POs and sub-district CEO, CEOs and POs. So basically you're gonna see very low rates of, uh, you know, very high rates of people being male. Uh, they tend to be in their early forties on average and they're pretty well educated. So I'd say that, you know, beyond college, the majority of these individuals have say completed these sort of short one year professionally oriented master's degrees. And something uh, worth pointing out as well is that, you know, there's at least self-reported high rates of comfort with the technology in these populations of individuals. So they're gonna, most of them are saying they're comfortable with information technology. They report that they own smartphones almost always. We actually see that in our, the rollout of our, our intervention, which is an Android app. So almost everyone has an Android uh, smartphone. And these uh, lower ranking officials here self-report that they're almost always accessing the status quo uh, website that exists for NREGs that provides them administrative data. So that's the, I'll talk about that in a little bit, but that's kind of like what our app is meant to improve on is the status quo website. Um, it's also interesting to see that in the, um, you know, based on our baseline surveys, what we see is, you know, strong evidence uh, of, of, of just a crazy amount of work being expected of these individuals. I mean, take it with a grain of salt that they're going to self-report 70 plus hours uh, of, of work per week, per, per week on average. But I will say that given our, in, in our interactions with individuals, everybody is working six days a week. Oftentimes they're working seven days a week and they do appear to be responsive at all hours. Um, so it's maybe not as crazy as it seems. And maybe a more convincing measure here is that between a quarter and a half of these positions 
um, of, of individuals in each of these positions are saying, look, they're being asked to work essentially double duty to fill in vacancies uh, of other positions in addition to this position as well. So there's a lot expected of them. And when we ask district officers about their perceptions of their subordinate officers at the sub-district level, what you see is that you know, large shares of them are saying, look, we agree or strongly agree that sub-district CEOs and POs are overworked. And we see much lower rates of them saying, we agree or strongly agree that these people are not honest. So again, this is just some suggestive evidence of you know, the, the potential um, higher relevance here of um, work overload versus say agency concerns. Um, and then what, one other thing you know, I can point out here is we asked sub-district officers to rank their challenges they face as implementers of, 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 in, of in regs, uh, eight, eight different categories. And the highest average rank was given to IT infrastructure issues, which you can think of as being like in, inconsistent internet and power. So you can think if you have problems with that, it's only gonna add to the difficulty of what you need to do. Um, let me skip that. Uh, okay, so here, let me now show you how did things look at right before we were rolling out in our two experimental states. So this is data based, this is from the universe of administrative data from the fiscal year 2016-17 in Jharkhand and Madhya Pradesh. The figure on the right here is a histogram um, at the sub-district month level, um, where I'm just showing the distribution of the average time taken to complete stage one. So the red line here is where the government, the government would like things to be, right? So that's at eight days. And so what you can see is that less than 20% of the time are you at or below that cutoff and you've got a really long right tail here. Um, okay, so there's um, the, at the average time taken is 15.3 days, standard deviation of nine days. And this little hump here is just me uh, coding, you know, uh, top coding things for the figure's sake. Um, so what are we doing with the, with the platform then? So I say platform because it's a, a mobile phone app and we have a desktop application, but we essentially only ever see officers using the mobile phone app version, which is maybe interesting in itself. So, so what does the app do? So let's think about you as a sub-district officer. If you were provided paid ash, what that's gonna let you do is understand your current and historical overall processing time performance, and you can break it out by step to see how you're doing. So that's kind of what's going on down here. You've got the stacked line chart where you can look either at the sub-district level or drill down to the village level within your sub-district, see how things were going. You can also gather, see very easily information about things that are currently delayed. So let's say that I'm a block official here on the left. I'm working in my block is Ragagar. I'm gonna say, oh, look, I've got 611 currently delayed musters. Musters, we're just saying that's a, you know, think of that as that's the package of things associated with a project work spell that are sort of moving through uh, from, to be verified and then getting people paid. You've got 106 cards requiring your attention. What does that mean? It means, ah, I have 106 subordinates at the village level who are associated with at least one delayed muster. So I can go see what's that individual's name, how many delayed musters are they associated with, you know, where is that delay, what is the ID number for the muster, what step is it stuck at, and I also have this button here where I can click that and directly send you a WhatsApp message and copy paste this info or call you directly without needing to say go look up what your phone number is. Um, now, the district version of this app is going to let officers look at the district or sub-district level. They can't drill all the way down to the village level. And both versions of the app are going to be offline compatible. So say if you're going out to the field um, and you don't have internet or uh, things like that, then you can still use the app and go through things. It's just um, it'll be have the information from the last time that the app auto-updated when you had internet uh, availability. And it does that once a day automatically, or you can make it do more often, which is potentially helpful as well, say, versus your status quo of being on a desktop in your office where power might be going out. And so what was the status quo is, you know, it's important to point out that Paydash isn't just taking information that these individuals never had access to. There's a set of web pages on the government um, MIS website uh, for, for NREGS, where what you have to deal with is this really unwieldy set of uh, spreadsheets that, you, that are on individual web pages. So basically think of if I wanna gather information I have to click on a minimum of one web page per village by step. Then it's useful to keep in mind that there are five separate steps in stage one, uh, and on average, 48 villages per sub-district in our, in our sample. So that's just a lot to deal with. And then you have to export that data and do additional calculations to put things in the format similar to what we're doing in Paydash. And I should say that when we were designing Paydash, we didn't just drop in from out of nowhere and just say, oh, here's how we think things should be. This was based on a lot of conversation uh, with officials at different levels too to try to make it fit their needs. 
Okay, so what is our uh, experimental design? So we were working, like I said before, at scale across Madhya Pradesh and Jharkhand. So, you know, absent one, one pilot district in each state, we have 73 districts of 561 sub-districts and four treatment arms. So we've got pure control, no one's receiving paid ash. District level paid ash treatment arm where district CEOs and POs are receiving paid ash. Our sub-district paid ash treatment arm where in those districts, all sub-district CEOs and POs are receiving sub-district paid ash. And then our treatment arm where we have a combination paid ash. So both district and sub-district level CEOs and POs are receiving their versions of paid ash. And we stratified uh, this randomization by uh, performance of whether you're an above or below median district in terms of payment time uh, defined based on you know, pre-intervention, the fiscal year 2015 and 16. Uh, we rolled out in early 2017 in MP, later in 2017, for Jarkond and the evaluation period ended in, in 2018 in August. Uh, that was because elections were uh, coming up in MP. And at that point, the election commission comes in, starts deputing officers and moving people around, et cetera, and also for logistical and budget, budget reasons. Okay, so conceptually, again, just to, just to hit this very quickly, um, what, how are we thinking about things here? We're saying, look, village stage delays may reflect local agency issues, whether that's shirking or you know, time taken to organize fraud. Sub-district stage delays, again, may reflect shirking or, you know, time required for bargaining with frontline workers related to work to rent sharing. Or again, absent these agency concerns, it could just be that people are overloaded doing their best and it just takes them a long time to get things done, given how much they're being asked to do. So why might Paydash then matter? Well, we think about Paydash as managing to lower the cost of information acquisition for these mid and upper level managers. Well, then district pay dash is going to, if it, it may improve the supervision ability by district officers for a given level of effort, leading to you know, stronger performance incentives for subordinates and a speeding up of things. Now, sub district pay dash, whether the provision of that actually improves things, is going to depend on whether we have these agency concerns at that level of the hierarchy. So, think about if you have a shirking individual and you provide them the app and you're making it easier for them to gather information, you haven't changed their incentives at all maybe they won't use it, you know, perhaps they just won't use it in any beneficial way, or if they're somehow involved in collusion, it may actually harm things and slow things down. So if we put these together, then sort of our predictions are that, you know, if you don't have agency concerns that are involving the sub-district level, then either district or sub-district pay dash may lower processing time, and you may observe a substitute relationship. So if you think about if, if for example, one way this could occur is, Say if I, a district official, am passing along useful information that I gather from the app to my subordinate at the sub-district level, well, if they now also have the app as well, you may have some redundancy and see a substitute relationship. Now, if these agency issues involving the sub-district level are, are, are an important constraint, then you can think of either, it's only gonna be when district paid ash alone is provided, you may see benefits by you know, the strengthening of performance incentives. And if you, like I said before, if you just give it to the sub-district level, maybe they're not really gonna do anything with it or make, make things worse. But if you provide it to both the district and the sub-district level, you might observe complementarity, right? In the sense that, well, if I give sub-district paid ash, maybe the people at that level are only gonna use it in a helpful way when you've also heightened the ability for their superiors to monitor what they're doing. Okay, so let me, um, you know, now I'll just skip, you know, we have a, a variety of administrative data, you know, app usage data and, and based on inline survey data. Uh, let me just show you usage. So here, um, you know, the dotted lines are district and sub-district POs, the solid lines are CEOs, uh, and this is all, you know, zero onward, so months post intervention rollout in each state. The gray shaded area is during the training period. So you can think of, you know, this maybe being sort of mechanically high usage because during the training sessions that we were doing in person with officers, they had their apps open, et cetera. So when we look from month two onward for POs, things look relatively stable at about 20 minutes per month. On average, CEOs are using the app very little, barely at all, which maybe makes sense if you think about if I as a CEO know that my PO has the app and they're the one that's really supposed to focus on unregs more, um, it doesn't seem crazy. Uh, the, the point of this table, there's too much here, sorry, is to say it's not the case that usage of paid ash differs significantly at a given level of the hierarchy, depending on whether the other level has it. So we just don't, we don't see that. Um, all right, so to evaluate then the effects of the provision of paid ash at different levels uh, on, our, on our outcomes of primary interest. So those are going to be, uh, at first, they're going to be the average time taken to complete stage one. 
And then as a measure of variability, the average absolute deviation, um, we're going to you know, have a straightforward regression approach here where we're going to run things at the sub-district month level. Um, we're waiting by the number of muster rolls or think of the project work spells um, um, because then what we're interested in is the impact on the average muster roll. Uh, and this is also in part, we pre-specified this because you can see a lot of variation in the volume of work occurring at different points in time in the year and across areas. But I should say that the, the results become actually stronger if we don't wait. So if that, if that um, matters to you, um, to, 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 your, to your background thinking, we're, it's fine either way for us. Um, and then we're going to include dummies uh, that turn on in the post-intervention period uh, for, you know, beta one here is gonna be associated with, if you were in um, the dummy is TD here, for whether you were in district pay dash district, uh, TS is whether you're in a sub-district pay dash district, and TC was whether you're in a combination district. Um, and so I should mention that of interest to us is gonna be this comparison of the beta three coefficient to the sum of beta one and beta two. Um, you know, because if beta three is larger than beta, the sum of beta one plus beta two, that's going to suggest or be consistent with complementarity. Whereas if beta three is smaller than that sum, it's going to suggest substitutability between the two. Okay. Um, all right. So let me now, uh, you know, talk, talk about what we're finding. Um, so columns one and two, we're looking at, at outcome wise at the average time taken at the sub-district month level to complete stage one. Um, and uh, columns three and four, the absolute um, uh, absolute deviation. So that's our measure of variability. Um, column one, we're pooling all the arms together as an any pay dash indicator. And we're going to see roughly a one day reduction in time to complete stage one. Um, if in column two, when we break that out by the different treatment arms, we're going to see you know, roughly the same size of effect. We can't reject the, the equality in any, any pairwise comparison there. And one thing that's interesting, you know, worth, worth noting is if we can look at the size of the coefficient beta three as compared to the sum of beta one and beta two, we're gonna see some evidence, uh, albeit not the strongest, but I'm gonna come back to some heterogeneity analysis. We really see this jump out. Um, we see some evidence of uh, substitutability here. And again, we also see some weaker evidence of a reduction in variability. Again, when I come back to heterogeneity analysis, we're gonna see some much stronger evidence there. Um, you know, we can also do here, just plot the results of, um, you know, an analogous event study specification, uh, the vertical dotted line there is, you know, one month prior to rollout in each state. Um, and what you can see here in the post-intervention periods um, is it's not that, say, we had some massive effect in the first couple of months that then just completely disappeared. It does appear that we have uh, persistent reductions in payment processing times. Um, and it's worth mentioning here that this period 10 here um, pools all periods 10 or greater, because in MP, we rolled out seven months ahead of time. Uh, relative to, to, excuse me, to Jarcon. So that pulls together periods 10 through 17. Um, and it looks, if we just did, you know, MP only, you'd see persistent effects out longer there too. Um, you know, a natural question might be, well, if what you're doing is increasing the pressure for people to do things quickly, might you have downstream harm uh, on to the quality of, of what's going on? And so we're going to look at this in two different ways. So the first of these is going to be um, looking at the payment requests that are sent to the central public financial management system after stage one is done. So remember, you've got these steps where village workers are doing some things and the sub-district is doing things, signing it off and sending it off. Well, what happens is, you know, what can happen is that those payment requests are, are failed to complete or are rejected in program terminology due to usually technical issues like having incorrect recipient account, bank, or ID, individual ID numbers. And so if what we think that Paydash is doing is maybe making people less careful in gathering or verifying those details, rejection rates might go up, you know, reflecting worse quality. On the flip side, if people have more time to work on that sort of, those sorts of issues, or it's just simpler for you to coordinate with your subordinates who are doing that, rejection rates might go down. So as our first quality proxy, we're gonna look at uh, as an outcome, the average share of worker payment requests that are rejected um, using the same specification as before. And what we're gonna see is uh, you know, we don't see any evidence of, of harm to quality uh, and see maybe some, some impacts uh, of a, what you can interpret as an improvement in quality. So relative to a 4.4% rejection rate in the control, we're going to see a reduction in that of, of one percentage point. Now, you may find this quality measure a bit more interesting or compelling. Uh, we're going to look at the outcomes of social audit reports. So what do I mean by a social audit report? There is an external audit agency uh, you know, the, um, a government agency uh, that goes around to villages to assess the quality of local and regs implementation. 
and they're there for a few weeks. And what they're going to do is generate these official reports and they code up four main categories. So we're just going to use those four categories um, as our outcomes of interest, where we're going to code up indicator variables for whether any of these categories are noted in these reports. So they're going to be one financial deviation. So that'll map to poor record keeping, usually uh, financial misappropriation. So that'll really uh, map to what, we're, what we'd probably think of as related to corruption collusion. So bribes, ghost workers, et cetera, and then grievances raised by workers uh, and other process violations. And so what we're going to do is, um, given the timing of social audit reports, you know, very few of them uh, had occurred pre-intervention. So we're just going to look at the post-intervention level uh, and, and compare village level outcomes in the post period. And I should say in this time period, no village is being hit more than once. And in terms of coverage between our intervention uh, rollout and our end in August of 2018, we're getting um, you know, roughly three quarters of villages in each sub-district on average are in the audit sample so that we've got pretty good coverage there. Uh, and just, to, you know, just to, to show you, look, we've got no observable impacts on reported corruption or quality measures. We know regardless of which of the four categories we look at, we don't see, see significant differences um, associated with provision of paydash at the district, sub-district, or combination levels, um, which is perhaps heartening. Um, now, I should also mention if you were thinking about, well, you are putting this tool into place, are you going to have spillover effects on um, sort of other you know, management behaviors? Like I mentioned before, we would have loved, and I should mention in the interest of time, I dropped a slide that was showing that there's a variety of positive and negative performance incentives used in this setting, um, whether sort of uh, monetary or not monetary, like, you know, publicly, publicly commending people, uh, docking pay, et cetera. Uh, we tried very hard to get data on that. It doesn't exist in any aggregated way. Um, so what we were able to do was think about transfers, uh, basically because we needed to keep track of where officers were uh, to make sure that the app provision kept up with who was where so we could deactivate things if you move from treatment to a control area, et cetera. Uh, but what that allows us to do is to, at different cross points in time, uh, have measures of whether position changes have occurred or not. Um, so here what we're able to look at is say, look, has any transfer occurred within six months? Um, and we can look first by hierarchy level. We're going to see that, you know, we don't see any change in transfers for district officers, uh, which we might expect given that, you know, they're the highest level that's receiving the app in the first place. Um, what we do see is that when district paydash is provided, so that when district officials receive paydash, transfers of officers at the lower level, at the sub-district level, are, uh, go down by 10 percentage points. Um, and when we drill into looking within the sub-district level in columns three and four, we see that it, you know, it appears to be, I mean, we can't reject the equality of the, of the district pay dash coefficients across uh, CEOs and POs, but at least suggestively, it seems like more of the action is among POs, which perhaps also uh, makes, makes a little more sense, given that they're the ones who are really uh, responsible for NREGs in these environments. And I would say what we're, we were trying to do now is unpack this a little bit more because it's a bit tricky because transfers are used both as reward and punishment. Um, you know, if you get moved to a place you really like versus one you dislike, uh, and the transfers of sub-district officials um, generally occur within districts. So we're still working on that. I would say that's, we're trying to unpack that a little better. Okay, so let me, um, you know, show you where we're at in terms of better unpacking mechanisms as well. So I think that we've shown some evidence of substitutability in the provision of sub-district and district pay to ash. Uh, which through the lens of our framework is going to suggest the relevance of work overload at the sub-district level being more important than say agency concerns with sub-district officers. But let's, you know, we're going to show you where we're at in terms of uh, kind of pushing beyond that as well. So first, um, and I'll show you why we're doing this, uh, we, we allow the impact of paydash to differ by this, you know, pre-intervention performance. So we're, you know, we're going to interact things with dummies for whether you're in a high or low delayed district. You know, again, defined it from before the intervention. And this is just plotting the coefficients uh, from that regression where you can see here in the left panel, uh, you know, all the action is really in these high, delayed, dis high delayed districts, whether it's district paid ash, sub-district paid ash, the combination, or if we pool things, um, this is really where the effects are concentrated. And you're seeing, you know, effects quite close to zero uh, and not too noisily estimated in low delay areas as well. And so, you know, this table is just showing the, uh, the underlying regression results. So columns one and two are for time to complete stage one. Uh, now we see that the effect is about three day reduction on average. And we see much stronger evidence of a reduction in variability as well, looking at ab the absolute deviation here in columns three and four. And I should also note that when we compare 
the coefficient on combination pay dash to the sum of district and, and sub-district only pay dash for high delay areas here, right, for both the average time to payment and the variability measure, we see strong evidence of substitutability. Now, if you were like, why are you cutting it by high and low delay? We can also then, you know, cut things, allow, allow the impact to vary more flexibly. So here's just by sextile, uh, you know, nothing strange is going on. We see that it looks like really the bottom, bottom three sextiles here. So the places that had the worst performance pre-intervention are really where the action's occurring and maybe a little bit of a hint of a slight slowing down uh, in the best performing area. Um, you know, that, that's, this is how things look. Uh, so what we, after looking, you know, we pre-specified that we wanted to, to look at heterogeneity by baseline performance. And then that begs the question of, okay, what is differing across these sorts of districts? Uh, so one thing that we found um, uh, is that they differ importantly in the way that they're administratively structured. So what we can see if you compare columns one and two and column three is the difference here, that the number of sub-districts is lower in high in districts that turn out to be high delay, and you have roughly twice the number of villages per subdistrict, which then you can think of as really amping up the workload for those subdistrict level officials. Because they have, you know, now I've got 75 villages on average that I'm keeping an eye on rather than 37. Um, and so what we can do then is um, you know, see, allow the impact of pay dash to vary, not just by whether you're a high versus low delay district. We can, you know, allow it to vary by your favorite measure of the village per sub-district measure. So in column one, it's a, you know, above versus below median district measure uh, by the average number of villages in the sub-districts in your district. In column two, it's just the average number of villages per sub-district in your district. In column three, it's the number of villages in each sub-district is what's being interacted. And what you can see is in each, regardless of the form of that variable you choose, that Paydash has stronger effects in terms of reducing uh, payment processing times in areas that have higher numbers of villages per sub-district. Uh, but it's also not that once you include that interaction, the interaction with a high delay uh, in indicator uh, becomes ins insignificant. So there's more going on there. So I think that you know we're also uh, certainly still uh, you know, trying to think about things uh, to better to better understand what what else is differing in the high delay areas. Okay, um, so finally, to to wrap up as I get close to the cutoff time here, uh, it's perhaps worth highlighting that we in our end line surveys um, we were only able to do this in one state, Madhya Pradesh. We had to do this over the phone due to COVID. But we had end line surveys with district and sub district POs where we asked them about their usage of Paydash uh, for those that were uh, you know, in, uh, treated officials. And so what you can see here in panel B um, is that you know, nearly two thirds of them or more are saying that they, how were they using information from Paydash? They said they were sharing it with their subordinates. Now it's also not that no one was using it to monitor their subordinate performance. We see here you know, 30 to 40% of people saying they were using it, the information that way, but we found it um, you know, sort of striking that they were saying that they were sharing it with their subordinates, which again would be fits with this story of, the, of what we see with the substitutability of pay dash provision at both levels and suggests an environment where it's not all about um, agency concerns, that it can be uh, consistent with a setting where you know, as important or more important are these workload constraints for people at the middle level of the hierarchy. Okay, so just to, to wrap up, um, so you know, with Paydash, we had a tool that plausibly lowers the cost of collecting information. Um, we, you know, we're finding that it improves uh, payment processing times. And tentatively, program reach is measured by uh, the volume of work that went up by about 10% post rollout. Um, you know, and I think the, the, we don't have any bulletproof evidence about you know, bureaucratic overload being a key constraint at the mid-level, but I think what we have right now is a variety of suggestive evidence that all fit together to suggest that you know, that, that, is, uh, that is an important constraint in this setting. Um, and I would also say that you know, might be a broader takeaway from this paper is that there's really strong, understandable policy support um, for putting digital technology into place to help improve state capacity, but that often takes the form of, oh, what we need to do is replace the people, replace the bureaucrats, replace the administrators. Um, and we think that you know, maybe this paper also shows that there's some additional traction potentially to be had by trying to think about, well, how can we use the technology to complement those people that at least for the foreseeable future are gonna be there uh, you know, running a lot of what's going on with the administration of the program. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yusuf.
Um, the interesting paper, it's not something that I see a lot. Of, and um, I don't know the literature very well. Um, but I was curious, um, I get the first question again. <laughs> um, I was curious, what's the relationship with this paper and the work of like Kartik and Paul and, and co-authors on the NREG's payment system and sort of, uh, yeah, how they stand in relation to each other? Right. Um, yeah, so there I think it's about, um, you know, biometric authentication uh, and they're going to, you know, so they're saying, you know, sort of a change in the way that workers are able to, you know, confirm they are who they are uh, to, to receive payment and they're going to find, um, they find a reduction in payment delays associated uh, with that uh, as well as a reduction in leakage, I believe. Um, and so I think the, yeah, so I think that that maybe then is sort of consistent with this in the sense of, look, if you have uh, thoughtfully designed technology, then maybe you can, um, you know, improve uh, program performance and that we're kind of at a different step in the process, which is, um, you know, not all the way at the end where people are trying to confirm they actually are who they say they are. We're saying like, as things are moving around ahead of time there, uh, you know, what's going on. Uh, Jonas, uh, you had a couple of questions in the chat and others uh, feel free to enter them. I know it's getting the end of the day, especially if you're in Europe or Africa or God forbid uh, Asia. Um, <laughs> but if you have some questions, uh, enter them in the chat. Oh, we also have Prabhat. So I guess let's go with uh, Jonas and then Prabhat. Right. Yeah. So one question was already answered in the chat. So the other one I was just wondering, so you, do you have any evidence on the distribution of usage? So you showed a bit like kind of the take up of usage of the app, but as 20 minutes per month seemed low, but I also had no idea what my, my prior was on this number, but it seemed like this could just be driven that a few people are using it a lot and then just many people don't use it at all. Because I mean, if you have some people who have like zero minutes, you know, they don't use it, right? Then. Right. Yeah, no, 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 that's a, that's a great question. So I have a few thoughts. Um, so I, I, what, what we're currently seeing, I would say that this is kind of the area we're next focus on is really, um, is, is that that's like what we wanna to add to the draft is exactly what you're talking about. So what we're seeing um, is you do have a subset of people that are kind of never users. So you should think of, you know, there's maybe about a third of officers, even the POs are just kind of are never using that. Um, and I will say that, um, you know, it's suggestive, but that if you look at usage and look at the association of usage with uh, processing times, there is a negative relationship there. So places that are, you've got more usage, you're seeing, uh, you know, larger reductions in processing times. But again, you know, that's just a, that's not, we don't make any causal claims there. Um, so uh, I think what you could also be interested in, which is kind of where we're going is, you know, what are the characteristics of these officers um, and, you know, what predicts whether they're higher or lower users? But that's, that's kind of where we're thinking of going next. I think where we're at right now is trying to think about how to do that in a, principled way because we have lots of um, characteristics from the baseline survey. What we could do is like run a kitchen sink regression, but we'd like to, to not just do that, but um, great question. Um, so yeah, you, definitely there's a solid chunk of people that are kind of never users. So you should think of maybe scaling up that 20 minute, uh, 20 minute uh, average by, you know, 0.6 seconds or something. Thanks. Okay. So, uh... You should, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great presentation. Uh, I have uh, two questions. One is uh, short, uh, do uh, like these sub district uh, officers, they, do they know when uh, district, of, whether district officers are also using the app or not? Because, uh, you know, I mean, that is something people just like think about it. Like, you know, okay, like if, if they are using, then we will have to comply or like, did you ask them, like, do they know like uh, they are using it or not? Like the, uh, like they're, they're, their bosses also seeing is this app or not? Yeah, so I would say, okay, this is going to be, uh, and this, I promise this is true. It's a similar answer to before, where that's a great question. We have that information in the endline survey, uh, and we're cleaning it up right now. So our sense is that there is at least a, a, a reasonable chunk of people are aware. Uh, so, like across levels, we ask districts, uh, POs, and subdistrict POs, you know, whether they, you know, both in control and treatment about, oh, do you know what's it the case that other district officers or block officers uh, in your area were using Paydash. And so it seems like there is some awareness. 
Um, and I would say too that I, I, um, you know, we don't view that necessarily as a problem. You can just think of that as like kind of baked into you know what the treatment effect is. And um, that was partially also I should mention what, partially why we clustered the provision of treatment to subdistrict officers at the district level because we know that these individuals are meeting regularly with district officers to talk about NREG's performance. And so just, you know, we spillovers were certainly going to occur uh, across uh, subdistrict officers within districts. Very good. Yeah. So yeah, that will be helpful to uh, uh, know. And then one more question I have is that because you, uh, many times you mentioned this thing that these officers are likely overburdened with a lot of, you know, and the information um, access becomes kind of costly for them. And that's where this uh, app is basically breaking that. Um, if they're, truly overburdened and they, uh, you know, starting to put more effort on uh, these, uh, clearing these payments, uh, should not we expect that they are doing it at a cost on some other task? And if, uh, so I, I know it might be very difficult because these officers are doing like, you know, uh, infinite number of things. Narega is just like one of those things they are doing. So, and we cannot really observe like what is the performance on uh, in other projects and all, but at least in Narega, uh, like suppose, uh, the delay uh, on, on payment uh, might be competing with the quality of projects and there is audit data on Nerega, right? Like uh, on this uh, social audit or some sort of audit data. Uh, do you think like it will be useful to include that also to see like if there's a trade-off here, like uh, if facilitated, yeah. you know? Yeah, uh, no, no. yeah. No, no, that's, that's very nice. So I'd say um, as far as a few thoughts, one about um, sort of, you know, these like multitasking concerns and then quality effects on other programs. Um, it's hard, we've been trying to think about whether we can get data from other programs to look at it directly. I would say that we, right now we've decided maybe it's not worth that effort because a few things. One, you know, we're really only seeing usage among POs. Their focus is on just in regs. Um, you may say, well, maybe then they focus on this more and bring it up to the CEO, which I, I guess I don't have a great answer to that. Um, also, yeah, sorry, I know I had to, I probably was speeding through things much too quickly here. Uh, the oddest thing, yes, we, so we, we look at that now and we don't see, um, and we were glad to finally get all that data. So we don't see impacts uh, like of a worsening of corruption or quality using the audits data, uh, the social audits data. So totally agreed. And that was a, that was a bit of a, um, uh, we were glad to be able to get that data to look at that question. Yeah. Very good. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? It's the end of a long day. Um, well, thank you, Yusuf. A very interesting paper. Uh, thank you all for attending. And um, we should thank uh, Mandy Chan and uh, Kirsty McNeil and Ed Sellers again at CEPR for organizing and staying late over there in the UK uh, for this. Um, and we hope to see you all again uh, tomorrow then. Thank you.